What is going on YouTube? It's Pete coming in hot with another video. Also known as that guy, Pete, you just refuse to invite to gatherings. I hope you are all doing well. I'm hanging in, got through another week. Humid as hell over here though. Um, yeah, so got the windows open, trying to get some breeze coming through. But um, yeah, what we are here to discuss today is, of course, the poll that I posted uh, about five days ago. So I pretty much have time to do it because I've been going to the gym in the mornings. So that's actually an adjustment, but it actually, you know, puts me on a better sleep schedule and everything. So working out in the morning was probably the right switch to make. So now I have more free time to do these videos um, and other things which is good at night. But like all polls, what we are going to do is the same exact format we always do. For those who are new, here's how it goes. I have a poll in the community section of my channel, the most recent one. I go through the actual content of what I typed so that you fully understand the context of today's topic and what line of thought allowed me to arrive at this topic and ask these questions. Ultimately, what the results were from asking that question and reading the comments from you, the subscribers and viewers. And <clears throat> the way I sort the comments is I do it from newest to oldest. So newest at the top, oldest at the bottom. I start with the oldest comment, work my way up to the newest. When I get to the end, I refresh one last time just to see if there's any additional comments that were posted over the course of this video and it's uh, recording. And if there is, great, I'll read it. If not, then okay. We'll just conclude the video at that point, okay? So today's poll is gonna be about the whole body count question. What's your boundaries on it? You know, what are the circumstances? You know, how do you feel about the car facts, basically? Guy or girl, doesn't matter. When you're picking someone for a long-term relationship, how do you feel about it? That's really what we're talking about here. So what we want to do, since we um, obviously are observing a society where promiscuity in general um, is on the rise, more so for women than for men, um, but still there is a smaller slice of men who can engage in promiscuity, we want to know basically what chain of events led to this, and then ultimately how you, the subscribers and viewers, feel about it when you're selecting for a long-term partner knowing this information. How does it make you feel? And, you know, how do you approach it when deciding, hey, should I have a relationship with this person? Should I not? So on and so forth. That's really what we're focusing on today. So without further ado, let's jump right in and begin the actual content of the poll. It's going to be a long one, so strap yourselves in. What up, homies? I got a question that both men and women are welcome to answer here. To be honest, I'm a bit surprised I did not ask for subscriber feedback on this sooner, given how much we talk about it. Of course, I speak of the age-old body count question, and whether or not it matters when selecting a long-term relationship partner. As always, I will do my absolute best to leave as few stones unturned as possible as I outline and unpack this from A to Z in typical Pete fashion. Though you'll find the ones I missed, I am sure. As is tradition. <laughs> now, this one will be long as there is just so much to say about it, so sit down and stay a while. For starters, irrespective of how comfortable or uncomfortable it makes us, humanity primarily evolved as a polygynous species. That is, one man, many female mates. Men would compete with one another, often violently, to secure resources, territory, and mates. It is the male way. The most successful and highest status males would have the most female mates out of any. And the further down the hierarchy you go, the fewer mates and opportunities that were available. Think basically modern analog, Chad, Normie, sub five. And the Chad lights and Normie lights in between. Okay. And even today, some of that ancestral structure echoes in places like Tinder and the blue check marks on the gram, but obviously not everywhere. But, you know, think like VIP sections in the club versus everybody else. The haves and the have-nots and so on. You get the idea. K 
kings, peasants, so on. Now, the reason polygyny prevailed over polyandry, which is one woman, many men, is because women have what we call maternity assurance. And that's aside from the fact that having a baby costs nine months up front. In ancestral times, if the baby grows in you, you know it is yours. Men did not have this luxury, let alone guarantee, unless it is known with absolute certitude that the woman is completely loyal and does not stray. Which, as you know, it's impossible to know that for sure. Now, a woman in modern times may want a loyal man, but if she herself is loyal and ends up pregnant, she knows it's his, irrespective of his loyalty. So she knows that she is investing in her offspring and nobody else's. The reason I want to bring this up is because whether you are a man or a woman, ideally, if you are going to invest in offspring, you want those offspring to be your own, ideally, right? Does that mean like people collectively just will never adopt a kid or anything like that? No, that's not what we're saying. But what we are saying generally, especially men in particular, is that they don't want to nut in a girl, think it's their kid, find out it's the neighbor's kid, and then get duped when the kid is like 13 years old. As Chris Rock said, oh, he has your hat. <laughs> you don't want that. So because of this general uncertainty that comes with women sleeping around from the male perspective, this is why men in particular really get put off by the idea of investing parentally in someone, even though, you know, we have modern things that allow us to basically sidestep the whole cost of being promiscuous, which is lots and lots of babies, even though we could sidestep that now with modern innovations, it doesn't change the fact that from the ancestral times, we still have that part in our brains that makes us what we are. So building off of that, ancestral men, on the other hand, were left in a position where they were vulnerable to getting stuck raising offspring that were not theirs when they could have been elsewhere creating their own offspring and investing in them as intended how many videos have you seen where a guy t comes shows up with a paternity test the girl breaks down with the crocodile tears and starts trying to shame the guy into sticking around happens more often than you think sadly because of this men have an intense mate guarding response and are repulsed by the idea of raising another child on average because if a man does not mate guard effectively he will get cucked and that is a very high risk that will go against his biological imperative, which is to spread his own seed, not nurture somebody else's. Whether you like it or not, it is what it is. So, at best, fraternal polyandry, if we're going to talk about that, exists, where brothers share a woman. Because even though none are 100% certain that the kid is 50% related to them, it is at least 25% related, which evidently suggests that's enough for investment in some, but certainly not all cases. In other words, most, not most, some guys in these polyandrous type circles, a huge minority of all civilizations, are okay if they're at least an uncle. But that is not the majority by and large. Now, if we're looking at modern times to contrast it with ancestral times, in other words, oofy doofy versus ooga booga, we now have DNA tests, surrogate moms, and all sorts of things to shake the world up. But we did not have these things in ancient times, and our brains still run on what evolved in those times. Naturally, this mate guarding response that safeguards against cuckoldry. And the ego that is invested in that mate guarding response. That same ego that when a guy walks in on his girl cheating, he fucking loses his shit. Yes, that's what this is. Now, on this particular part, Thank, thank you, uh, Thinking Ape, for correcting me on this. Um, and then thinking about it afterwards, I think this is what I meant to say. But after the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, and so on, something happened. The Industrial Revolution was really, I think, the game changer. I wrote Agricultural Revolution here, but he corrected me and said that it kind of operated in tandem with the Bronze and Iron Age, which is definitely more accurate. I confirmed it myself. Industrial Revolution was more the game changer. We're talking refrigerators, dishwashers, vacuums. Things like this were invented, quality of life improvements to make life easier for women, right? And I suppose men as well, but men still had to build all the stuff. So they still had to put the blood, sweat, and tears in. But human tools were getting more complex. Human ideas were growing in scope. And eventually enforced monogamy became a part of this as well. Because again, industrial revolution, advanced societies, this wasn't 
what Ooga Booga had in mind. Ooga Booga had tribal warfare and violent competition for resources, territory, and mates in mind. War, not peace, where such civilizations can flourish. But what did enforced monogamy do? It curtailed the men who got out under the old model, basically got cut out, and minimized the violence that could result from that. Because if you have a bunch of men with nothing to lose, they know they're low in the hierarchy, they will take more extreme risks to elevate themselves in said hierarchy. But with enforced monogamy, you now have a social structure that near guaranteed paternity assurance. For the first time, an alternative was at the forefront. Women and men alike were both certain that their children were theirs in more cases than the other way around, where only the mom was certain. Men had skin in the game and a reason to work their asses off to give rise to one of the greatest civilizations this world has ever seen, as opposed to endless wars between tribes over a limited number of mates. Monogamy meant more men had a mate, and the historically polygynous kingpins either conceded and conformed to monogamy or quietly brought their harems underground. But then, something else happened. Something Mother Nature could have never foreseen. The birth control pill was a major scientific innovation in the course of human history and the catalyst for the removal of norms surrounding physical intimacy, the revolution that embodied the removal of said norms, and the hookup culture, as well as all that came with it. Coltane did an excellent video on this. The biology, the culture, the ideology, and how it all rolls downhill. And he showed how the moment the watershed moment, the birth control happened, a lot of shit that came after that really changed. Okay? So this was a really big deal. It was a biological game changer that allowed women to engage in casual fun the same way men do and walk around with virtually no risk of an undesired child, a.k.a they could rack up body counts just like men do at minimal cost. Couple this with the morning after pill and the clinic and you can near guarantee that. Basically, women could live like men in name, sleep with whoever they want, and attach notches to the bedpost of conquest, just as men do, despite still being women, biologically, XX and XY, they're still different. But again, when you, you socially engineer a world with this origin point, you can create the illusion of a world where men and women are the same, and you can reinforce those comforts, those luxury beliefs, if you will, with modern innovations. And that's exactly what we did. We put a lot of equalizers in place, and it altered the perception of how we view the world. And because women, basically it didn't cost them nine months if they chose the wrong mate, they had incentive with minimal risk to pursue the kingpins they so desired and have a toss in the hay. No strings, no fuss, no muss. And the interesting thing about it, though, is their ooga booga is still driving them to go and sleep with that guy to have a baby. But the brain can't understand that she took a pill to stop the pregnancy from happening, so the brain still releases the chemicals that come with doing that, and you get the idea. Because it doesn't understand. MS-DOS does not understand Windows 11. So... Despite all of these equalizers, though, you still had a fairly mixed bag in terms of sociosexuality. Sociosexuality is essentially one's attitude towards casual sex. High sociosexuality, pretty open to it. Low sociosexuality, not really open to it. They want it reserved more for serious interactions. Now we have the internet that followed after, and by extension, social media and dating apps in the digital age. These features gave both men and women access to more information and exposed them to more people than anyone who came before them. Public opinion could be shaped and molded more easily and long term. Metal Gear Solid 2 called it. It's pretty much what we have now. Echo chambers and everyone just sort of arguing from their little ponds. If you haven't played that game, I encourage you to do so. It's aged well. The likes of Kim Kardashian and Cardi B took center stage and began influencing what was perceived as socially acceptable and unacceptable, even further than the pill ever could because the internet has so much range, right? Now, despite the pill being, in my opinion, ground zero, I think the internet made a bigger splash. But even people who are on the fence about embracing their more base instincts are likely to jump on the hedonistic treadmill now or at least sample a taste with complete disregard as to how that can damage their prospects for long-term mates later. In other words, 
there are people who have an issue with body count. So if you rack one up, you're going to close off some options. Versus not racking one up, you will have more options, potentially. More true as a woman could be more true as a man in some respects. However, there are also a lot of women who do like a guy with experience. So, that being said, it can easily go in the opposite direction for men in particular. Because as we know, for men, sex is very difficult to get, comparatively speaking. While for women, it's not that hard to get. Unless, like, they let themselves go and really fucked up. Where, like, we have to really put juggernaut law to the test. So, essentially speaking, humanity came full circle as the concepts like polyamory gained more popularity. We had this polygyn to set up. Then we had this period of enforced monogamy that gave rise to this amazing oofy doofy that we have today. And then we removed all the social norms because we got too comfortable. And now the dating dynamics are kind of going back to the ooga booga. The polygynist type deal. Interesting how that works. But this creates a dynamic where not only women, but now also men have to consider body counts because with the birth control pill, there's no incentive to hold back. So now both must consider this. And they have to consider general attitudes towards the act, aka sociosexuality, when selecting a partner for long term. For example, someone with high sociosexuality and someone with low sociosexuality probably not going to be compatible. It is what it is. Now, not only are more casual attitudes, aka high sociosexuality, more likely to be encountered en masse, it is a near certainty you'll find that wherever you go. But before the pill, of course, the promiscuous on both ends, men and women alike, did exist. Women would quietly see the nine months through at their aunt's house in another state, and womanizers would disappear before the girl even got confirmation she was pregnant. Of course, these things happened, right? There are people, irrespective of environmental influence, that are going to be promiscuous no matter what. And there's going to be people, irrespective of environmental influences, that are going to be comparatively prudish. And then a good, good swath of people are on the fence. And depending on what the norms are, that's kind of where they are probably going to swing. Because they have a much more variable um, range for genetic expression than the extreme tails of the distribution. Of course. So, women always had to be on guard in particular and wary of players trying to masquerade as valid suitors before the pill. But the pill rendered these things obsolete. Which some would say is good. Because it opens up your options, right? While social media altered social perception of casual encounters from being something that could leave you hurt and empty, which I believe that's exactly what it does, to women in particular, to something that's fun and exciting all the time. However, it can also be argued that the modern innovations of the digital age are undoing all the good that the age of enforced monogamy instilled and gave rise to. A collapse, if you will. But that is a separate discussion, and while that system was in no way perfect either, that is, enforced monogamy, it is what it is. Now we have people realizing that after having their fun, they can't get a long-term relationship because of it, which means they either have to hold the L and suffer the consequences, or they have to lie to their partner by concealing the truth. And in my opinion, that's a terrible foundation for a relationship if you want it to last. Because sooner or later, they will find out about the lie. And then the relationship just falls apart after all that emotional investment was made instead of it falling apart when there was minimal investment made. So you just wasted both parties' times. Yeah. The way I look at it, like, how, how good and fun is this casual stuff if you have to be fucking hammered half the time just to engage in it? <clears throat> you know? But now that we understand the whole story, right, the full circle now, on why body count's being higher than they've ever been as a thing, what enabled this, and we also know why it matters from an evolutionary perspective, why it kind of can leave people, especially men in particular, unsettled, we now must ask ourselves what that means in the context of seeking a long-term relationship, where the last thing you want is to get got and played like a damn fool of a violin. If you and the person next to you buy the same thing, you paid a thousand bucks and they paid five hundred, you're gonna feel pretty stupid and want your five hundred dollars back. I know I would, so let's peel back the layers. So when I ask my question, there's a couple of factors to consider when determining boundaries on this. 
So the first question is one that I want you to elaborate on in your voluntary commentary on this post. And the second question more or less will be the poll options. So here's the first question. The practice what you preach versus the do as I say, not as I do problem. That is, do you hold your view of your count um, as something that doesn't matter while your partner's count does matter? Do you hold the view that you need to hold yourself to the same standard you impose on a prospective partner? Or do you just not give a shit at all because you yourself have been around the block, so no point even trying to hold anyone to a standard? Or two, the second part, which is in the polls, is about pricing. Some people, very hard line about this. They demand a virgin. Usually it is men more than women who demand this because of that mate guarding instinct, of course, and satisfying said mate guarding instinct. But it's not unheard of, especially in religious circles, for a woman to want that too. Now, other people are okay with their partner having bodies if those bodies were accumulated within the context of a serious relationship and not from flings or one-night stands. That way, the person knows they are paying the same price, aka not paying $1,000 when the other person got it for $500. You do not want that. Lastly, there are those who don't care at all completely indifferent to the whole thing and against all ancestral odds, they are here feeling what they feel, namely not a care in the world. Defective mate guarding response for whatever reason. But based on these two points, I want you to give your thoughts as a man or as a woman. Select your option from the provided ones and feel free to elaborate more. If your option is not present in the first four, select the other option as that encompasses anything that is not listed. Elaborate in particular about the practice what you preach versus do as I say not as I do for nuance. And the second point is what the polls will encompass as I have already stated. As always, thanks for your support and I look forward to the conversation. So that was the poll. You get what I'm talking about. I'm giving you the history on how we kind of got to this place where body counts are going up and it's kind of able to do that with minimal physical blowback, not a lot of nine months being charged here. That being said, some people don't use any protection at all and we got a lot of single moms with babies too. It happens, right? So we have some of that going on also. But again, the birth control pill definitely changed a lot in terms of perception. As did the industrial revolution before that, as did the digital revolution after it. Social media, dating apps, and stuff like this. So let's talk about the options now. So the options are as follows. The first one is I am hard line on this. If the count ain't zero, no point. Or as Undead Chronic would like to say, no hymen, no diamond. Very hard line. The count must be zero. Now, the second option is okay if they only had it in relationships, not okay if they had flings. Basically, if every man or every woman that came before you basically had to pay the price of relationship in order to be intimate with the person, okay you're paying the same price. But not okay if other people got in at a steep discount, aka one night stand or casual flings. The third option is the opposite. I'm the odd one. Okay on flings, not okay on relationships. An odd choice, but I put it there in case some people would vote for it. The fourth option is that you are completely indifferent and don't care at all about body count. You have successfully shut down the mate guarding instincts. And the last option, of course, is other, in case the first four don't cover it for you. So 243 votes, about 12% margin of error. On the first option, 22% said hard line. Could be as high as 34, could be as low as 10. The most chosen option is the second one. Okay if it was in relationships, but not okay if it was in flings. Basically, like, look, man, I just want to pay the same price that everyone before me paid, and I'm okay. Otherwise, I feel like I'm getting ripped off. Fair. 51% said that. Could be as high as 63, could be as low as 39. Odd one out says the opposite of option two. Cool with the flings, not cool with the past relationships. 2% said that, meaning as low as zero or as high as 14 completely indifferent and do not care at all, 12%, which means as low as zero once again, or as high as 24. And other said 13%, meaning as low as one or as high as 25. Those were the options. So what we can see from the results is most people, they're okay with a little bit of Carfax 
provided that it's within the context of a serious relationship, an LTR. If everyone that came before you paid the price of LTR, then you're okay with paying LTR price. If other people paid a comparatively cheaper price via one night stand, buying them a drink, getting drunk together and having to toss in the hay at some concert while you have to commit with a full relationship, not cool with that. That's what most people seem to say. And the second obvious answer is basically virgin. That would be the second most common answer. Basically between those two, you're covering like almost three fourths of the equation. Third most common answer is other. Fourth is I don't care. And fifth, of course, is the, the odd one out, the least common answer. And those are the options. Great. So we covered all of that. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through the comments themselves. And we got a lot to go through. So this should be a pretty long video, but it's okay. This should get interesting. The first comment is from Search for the Truth. He says, I'm self-employed. I take care of myself and I'm doing well. I don't settle and I won't accept a woman who's vaccinated, woke, overweight, has a body count of even two. Women, you made your bed, now lay in it with your cats and dogs. But ultimately, women really get to decide if not being with you is an L or not. There may be some women you meet where you'll reject them because of that, and now they have to hold the L. Sure. And there's some who won't give a fuck at all. It is what it is. But, ladies, you have to understand... Just as many of you are like, oh, six feet tall, six inch dick, six figure income. He might look at you and say, oh yeah, okay. Zero body count, zero debt, and zero bullshit. You know, like he has his fucking standards too. And that's just the reality. That's just the reality. And fellas, you also equally have to understand that if you have a body count, there's a chance that a girl you really like might turn you down because she's low in sociosexuality. So it's a two-way street. And you have to be prepared for that. So, you know, we could t we can't really talk about, you know, oh, you know, you need to own it, this, that, and the third. Because at the end of the day, your predispositions via your genetic environmental mix ultimately is what drove you to do what you did. The reality is, though, you just need to accept the outcomes attached to that mix. And sometimes those outcomes aren't exactly favorable, is what it is. So thanks for your commentary. Search for the truth. Next, we got Leslie. What up, Leslie? I have observed that many religious people who grew up in a purity culture oftentimes are paradoxically actually more forgiving of past one-night stands and a potential partner than they are of long-term relationships outside of marriage. They minimize the former as just a temporary succumbing to the temptations of the flesh, while judging the latter as shacking up and living in sin. As evidence of this, I have heard ministers preach that if God has forgiven a girl for a past indiscretion, then a future husband should forgive her as well. Doesn't mean that he will. If there is a God, then maybe he shouldn't have created a guy with the fucking ooga booga response to mate guard if he wanted the guy to forgive. <laughs> Just putting that out there, right? But not saying that I agree with this. I'm just pointing out this observation that will probably come as surprising to anyone who has ever been exposed to this type of purity culture and the unusual and sometimes contradictory social norms that often accompany it. Sure. So yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, some people might look at it like a toss in the hay is not really a big deal. But at the end of the day, we all know that if you have too many tosses in the hay, that could just kind of become your speed, your new normal. It's just that when guys have tosses in the hay, they tend to stay in that lane. You do get a few like Roosh V who try to turn around and try to get a wife or something and it doesn't work out, of course. But by and large, what we see, especially after you know birth control pill, feminism and stuff, yeah, women started moving around like men, casually sleeping around and doing all these things. But the problem is then they want to go back and have a traditional marriage at the end of it, right? And it's like, okay, but you you gave up that traditional life for this modern one. So there's no going back. You can't undo it, right? That's kind of the problem. So if you're asking for a traditionally minded man, but you present as a modern minded woman, there's an irreconcilable difference there. And that's always going to cause problems in the relationship. You have to be on the same page with how you view sex. And often your past sexual experiences are a reflection of how you view sex. So if your experiences are vastly different, then there's going to be a disconnect, I think, inside and outside the bedroom. That is a certainty, I would say. 
Now, the replies to Leslie begins with Bob V. Now, he says, thanks for reminding me why I don't go to church. <laughs> the Bible is clear that fornicators become one flesh. In other words, both men and women must wait for everyone they ever had intercourse with to die before they can get married. Effectively, only virgins can get married. Damn, man. Yeah. I mean, that, that that's what the good book said. Yep. So, it is what it is. Orbs app replies, I think that more of a post hoc rationalization of wanting to rebel against the values you were brought up in. You see this with highly religious families churning out staunch atheists with greater regularity than the more mild ones. Not that I think atheists are wrong, just seems to be how it goes. Ditto for the extreme of promiscuity as opposed to the ideal of no sex until marriage. Your description of one night stand being perceived as lapses of judgment matches in my experience as well. Many, most, of those brought up in purity culture who advise celibacy until marriage are operating at such a huge conflict with the prevailing societal norms where casual sex is okay, if not a defining aspect of the validity of your masculinity or femininity in some circles, and sex in relationships is never even questioned. Those who hold values of a purity culture are going to be tempted by the abundance, depending on your position in the sexual marketplace, of casual sex instead of waiting until marriage. Sure. Absolutely. The problem is, though, that we have a lot of a lot of women where they go and they give in to the temptation of the flesh, if you will, which would be considered, again, kind of against this traditional, like, norms you would expect, which is kind of like, hey, you know, if you can't fucking keep it in your pants, at least keep the body count kind of low, you know, like, meet us halfway at least. Like, you can't even do that, but then you come back around and now you say, okay, now I want a traditional marriage. But the thing is, like, you don't even realize how unfit you are for a traditional marriage. You just want all the bells and whistles that give you the comforts of, li of like, an easier lifestyle. You want that. But then when it's time to, like, step up to the plate and actually be a good partner, you can't do it. While guys who engage in that, they, they kind of just keep hanging out on Tinder and swiping away and just banging away as long as they can. And they just don't get married. You know? So they kind of sidestep the whole thing. But most adherents of purity culture, they've mostly been fed down religious doctrine rather than any practical reason to avoid it, so they will succumb quite easily to that tantalizing of a force when it's so readily available. Visnak continues the conversation. Most of those who cling to religion the hardest are those ashamed of how they live, looking for a cheap way to feel better about themselves. As an old saying goes, I asked God for a bicycle, but I know God doesn't work that way. So I stole a bike and asked for forgiveness. So many people, what they'll do is they'll commit a bunch of sin, they'll go to the confession booth, confess everything, say a couple of acts of contrition, and they think, okay, everything's hunky-dory now. No, it's not. No, it's not. But they'll put great emphasis on the easy stuff, like going to church and singing along, which then becomes an allowance that pays for the bad behaviors they had no real intention of changing anyways. Correct. Do a bad thing, then do a couple of good things to wash it out. And in your mind, you think you're still a good person in the aggregate. But here in atheist Scandinavia, especially among the younger folk, the only active Christians are those very serious about it and those very unserious about it. On more than one occasion, my friend and the girl who turned him to Christ would start shagging right in front of me, but only as a commercial break from talking to me about how I too could become a good Christian. They would go on to have an abortion and break off their engagement. Sprinkle on a little gynocentrism, it's no surprise the minister gives a pass for what's typically easy for the woman, sleeping around, and goes hard on what disadvantages her, losing a provider. Of course. Yeah, because again, when you live in a gynocentric society, it, it trickles down. And they want, they want basically everyone, everywhere, to get on board with this accountability-denying shit. And... Um, or perhaps in a more genetic environmental mix way, get on board with the idea of separating the cause from the effect, aka the outcome of having this genetic environmental mix. Namely, that gives rise to this promiscuous hoe phase type shit. And that's what happens. While the guys, they've pretty much always kind of been the, this way where they, they act like Leonardo DiCaprio, they go out there, they smash, 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 and they never get married. They don't get married, right? And they just sort of stay on that hedonistic treadmill, but they stay in that lane. And all the women kind of know this guy's a player. He's a bad boy. There's no point, like, 
you know, shacking up with him because of what he is. Um, Fit Fingers continues the conversation and says, I'm going to have to ask my Christian fellers what they think on this one. Not sure if you just pray the skank away or some other shenanigans for the random nightly activities, but I'd imagine this old savior himself would be too pleased if you were trying to hold on to some broski for the long haul, but tried to do so without the proper bonding known as funerals with cake. I mean marriage. <laughs> without that, then I'd imagine he'd boop yo ass right down yonder in the toasty lake. <laughs> Calls it the toasty lake. That's funny. Leslie replies and says, waking up to your comment has made a day off to a good start. Thanks for your one-of-a-kind wit. And I have come to the conclusion that many of the people in purity culture religions actually do have the genetics for a fast life strategy. They just subvert their untapped fast life's energy by doubling down on their piety. Well, you also have to consider their ability to discipline themselves and double down on said piety also is part of their genetic environmental mix. Yes. Good conversation. Next, we got Fernando. So I dated women with higher body counts, and my last girlfriend married early and had only one count. I gotta say, that is not really set in stone. Genuine desire, which I think is the most important thing in a relationship, oh, that matters, for sure, can come even from a woman with higher counts. It could. I guess it depends on the individual. But the question also is, how long does the genuine desire last? Right? Like, if alpha imprint is a thing and you can't measure up, what happens to that desire over time? Could it wane? Will it survive? I know there's no guarantees in these things, but here's the thing. If the relationship is going to end anyway, do you want to put yourself in a position that speeds the process along, or do you want to kind of enjoy your relationship a little bit before it crashes? <laughs> you know? That's kind of um, what we're looking at here. But mental issues and trauma can affect how a person behaves. That's true. But I can say that at this point in my life, later 30s, that I'm a hypocrite in this subject as I'm down to hook up with women even if their body count is high. Yes, but just remember that a man's criteria for a hookup and man's criteria for an LTR are two different things. Men can separate it, generally. But to take it seriously, only she has a low one. In the subject about relationships or flings, I would say I wouldn't take a woman who, was, who has one night stands serious. And relationships depends on how many she had. Because the comparison is real, even if a woman has genuine desire for you at the beginning, you have to measure up in the long run. Precisely. Alpha imprint is real. Like, if you can't make that girl orgasm better than anyone who came before you, she will know that. <laughs> she, she knows her body, right? She knows what's been done to her in the past in a positive sense. And she knows whether you measure up to that mark or not. And basically, if your flag isn't ahead of everybody else's flag, that's going to be a point of contention. She may not tell you it's a point of contention, but it will be a point of contention. So fellas, do not sleep on the female orgasm. It does matter. <laughs> but these are all excellent points, Fernando. Yeah, basically, at the end of the day, he's kind of looking at it like, well, listen, I've had my fun, I've had my experiences, so it's kind of hard for me to really make a case here, but if I could have it my way, a woman with a low count would be ideal. And it's like, fair. Because if a woman has a higher count, it's more competition um, in terms of, you know, you versus all past partners in her mind. Because, listen, you know, they compare. It is what it is. Yeah, but in terms of, like, you know, everyone, I can't speak for everyone, but for myself, I can say that, like, I don't think about my exes at all. Zoso says, I voted the second option. I had three different experiences with different women where they clearly stated they wanted something casual. Okay. First time I was a virgin, the other two times I wasn't. But the experience was almost the same. Extremely uncomfortable, didn't get hard at all, and didn't feel a single thing. This meant to me that clearly I'm not a casual hookup type of guy. Most likely. I would also want to bring to your attention that it was actually, I forgot where the fuck the statistic came from. I don't have the exact numbers, but what I do know is this, that women tend to orgasm more when they are having sex with a long-term partner than a casual fling. Probably because they're one, for one, a lot of these flings, they're fucking hammered, for one. But for two, it's just generally not as enjoyable, right? It's like they're trying to sell themselves on the idea that, it, that it's fun to do this, when really, it's just sort of like social norms and, and pressures, and they're just kind of going with the crowd. But... It's not really as rewarding um, as a, um, an LTR. 
The difference is, though, you're a guy. So if you're not enjoying it, it's going to be clear as day because you're going to have a fucking, you know, you know, flaccid D over there. But for a chick, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to notice these things. Um, not impossible, just just more difficult because, you know, she doesn't have like the, you know. So it's a little different. But I uh, just wanted to put that out there. It's not just you, I guess. And it's not just men. But the dude said, I'm the same way. Um, I got to date someone for a month or two, develop some affection towards them before I had sex. Otherwise, it's the same. I have performance anxiety and can't get it up. I just wanted to say that to build it off of Zoso's first paragraph. Because just to let you know, you're not alone in this. But as time goes by, you're trying to be more open to the idea of accepting someone's slutty past. You're going against the mate guarding response and the MS DOS. That ain't easy to do. Because you have so much ego invested in that. Because remember, the purpose of your ego is to protect you. That's the purpose of it. But sometimes that can backfire. Because your ego, which is an MS-DOS thing, can't understand Windows 11 innovations. That causes that reconciliation issue. And this is why we are what we are with the standards that we have. Men and women alike. But I haven't met someone that has a past and was able to make me feel something other than a physical sensation, which again, I clearly need in order to have sex with someone. Demisexual as it is called. I would say that I fall into this category also where I have to feel something for her. I have to, to get into it. Yeah. Although I don't have the most experience, for now all women I've met that have been in favor of casual flings have something that it's very hard to point out where I can't feel a connection, can't bother, and it makes me don't care at all. He then goes on to reply to the dude and says, I don't have performance anxiety, but the moment I don't feel anything, I start to feel anxiety because I don't know how to resolve the situation. Correct. It's very, it's very difficult when you're in a situation and you don't really know how to tackle it. And naturally, as a result of not knowing how to tackle it, anxiety sets in. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and that again, that stems from the fact that again, there's a gap in the experience level between you, and it's just it's just like again, different perceptions of sexuality, what's like you know, okay, what's not okay, and of course, it's no surprise that you know a casual girl and a demisexual guy like they're not gonna they're not gonna be able to find that common ground sexually, and then the rest of it just sort of falls apart. The darkest night says, I'd say if you have no experience, she shouldn't have any. If you have experience, she should be on your level too, but I do think a girl with zero body count is and should be the ideal for every guy. But if that guy is jumping around taking every girl's V card, that creates the problem. If people stuck together and didn't cheat and were monogamous staying together to death, do they part? We wouldn't have older men dipping and double dipping into younger men's options, ruining it for them. It just creates a spiral loop of worse dating pool and experience for next generation of boys that isn't counting social media feminism and the gender population where being more men than women, right? Because if there's more men than women, fewer mate options for men. Surplus. No good. So, this make, this reminds me of the uh, the Chad is the grass greener on the other side video where we talked about these Chads going around taking V cards, right? What that does is, again, it creates a bunch of psychologically damaged women who got, got basically, their version of getting got. And now they're in a position where now they're on the hedonistic treadmill. And now they're paying that forward to other guys. And then those guys become assholes. And then those guys are paying it forward to other girls. And as you said, it kind of just keeps going and going and going and going and going. And of course, because the older guys are more established, uh, they have the provision ability, they have the protection ability, they have the leadership ability, they have all these things in addition to probably being well put together and so on and so forth. Those guys can quite easily just go in and take the younger girls which again builds this harem. And when you have this polygynous structure, what happens the further down the hierarchy you go? You get a bunch of men cut out. That's what happens. And that puts us in a very um, unfortunate state of affairs. And this is why I think in part you're seeing a lot more male violence as well. When you have men that don't feel like they have skin in the game, they lash out. That's part of the male condition, male nature. Mm-hmm. Plan B says, why invest in damaged goods? Why invest in a broken system? Why are men still hanging on to traditional modes of thinking? Women certainly aren't. That's true. There are women that certainly aren't hanging on to traditional modes of thinking because, again, women kind of operate on groupthink. So whatever the prevailing social convention is, that's kind of what they're going to go with. Because, again, social approval matters. While for men, I mean, again, we tend to operate 
pretty simplistically just kind of on the default MS-DOS. The problem is, though, is if the default MS-DOS is irreconcilable with what we got going on in the Windows 11 world, you get a lot of disenfranchised men that are cut out. So I generally agree that if you as a man, you're low in sociosexuality, then you're probably going to view women who are high in sociosexuality for the purposes of LTR as damaged goods. And the system, hookup culture, that's churning them out as a broken system. And if you as a man are traditional, you're not going to invest in that in the traditional sense. You're only going to invest in that in the modern sense, which means, again, these are casual flings at best. Nothing else. So I agree with that. Alicia... What's going on, Alicia? She says, I'm going for indifferent. But obviously, it's a red flag if someone's had a lot of relationships and flings because it means they probably can't maintain one, right? Honestly, anyone who's had three or more long-term relationships is a red flag. And once someone has had over five flings, it starts to become a red flag. She goes on to say that not all the time, though. Like, if I was single and met someone and I really clicked and felt I could trust them, then I probably wouldn't care that much. Within reason. Me and my partner were both virgins before we got together, so I may be more prudish than some others. Not a bad thing. I have female friends who date guys who have had over 100, and to be honest, that would concern me too much. I feel 100 plus is pathological. Yeah, but you also have to understand also that a lot of guys, they might use sex the same way they use alcohol or drugs or gambling to just sort of cope with other shit they have going on. So I wouldn't say pathological like in the the psychopathic sense, you know? Some guys, for sure, it's like that. Um, yeah, but I just I do think, though, that there are a lot of guys out there that, again, they use sex as a coping mechanism. Um, whether they have to pay for it or not, that's a whole different tale. But you get the point. Also, I hold myself to a higher standard than those around me. I'm quite forgiving and don't care what other people do as long as they try to be moral about it and not hurt others. Straight shooter approach. I like that. I view the world in a way that things are mostly just being in the right place at the right time. True. Luck-based. And if I was born into different circumstances, different set of luck, I could have been promiscuous. True. Had the genetic environmental mix been different, you very well might have been. But I don't think casual fun would be fulfilling. Given your current genetic environmental mix, that is the opinion you have formed. Yes. And I'm very happy with my choices. Your outcomes. Fair enough. The dude replies and says, what's your definition of long-term relationship? What makes it a red flag to you? I see women that have only had short-term relationships as a red flag. It tells me she's likely hard to please or poor at choosing partners. True. True. Yeah, because if a dude's had a lot of relationships, it probably means he got dumped a lot. It's like, well, then why the fuck did he get dumped a lot? Well, if a girl's had a lot of short-term relationships, it's like... Like, dude, how, 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 how cheap have you charged for this in the past? You know, like that's kind of just shows you the contrast and the mindset there. But Alicia says it depends a lot on age. That's true. Cognitive development. I think anything over two years, maybe, since that tends to be the longest amount of time the honeymoon phase ends. But then again, I suppose if someone is constantly breaking up once the honeymoon phase is over, then that's a problem too, of course, because it demonstrates that they're not in the relationship for the long haul. They're just in the relationship for the dopamine, the serotonin, the oxytocin. Just what their reward center is telling them to be in it for. And of course, you, the reality is when you're in a relationship, you're not always going to feel that way. There's going to be bad days. And when there are bad days, again, yes, it's going to suck ass in the moment. And you're going to be emotional. It's going to be hard to be logical in that moment. But you got to see it through to the other side and keep it going. And obviously, people who can't do that, not really good prospects for long-term relationships. So I get that as well. And there's an element of maturity that comes with that. She goes on to say, so you wouldn't be bothered if she had three or more LTRs that didn't work out? Would you not be thinking to yourself, why did these relationships not work and who ended it with who and why? The thought definitely does occur. Absolutely. Um, But, you know, on average, women end relationships more than men and relationships obviously three relationships where the guy dumped her obviously it's very different situation than three relationships where she dumped the guy in both situations you know again i generally advise against asking about previous exes uh in intricate detail because you probably don't want to hear it as much as you think you do you kind of just want a general idea of the car facts you don't need the details 
um, to make a judgment. That being said, um, I would say those two situations, though, where she dumped three versus she got dumped three times, two very different contexts. So I would say, you know, if you are someone who needs to know the details, sure, you know, maybe it would bother you, maybe it wouldn't. For people who wouldn't bother, they probably don't give a shit. But the dude replied and said, I generally ask my partners what went wrong in their past relationships to get a feel for what they are like or if they took any accountability for it failing. So no, it won't bug me. I'm 37. I don't expect women my age to be nuns after all. That's true. Neither do I. I don't expect I don't expect that. Um, but you know, my experience is at a minimum. So I just think it's fair for me to want that um, from the girl I'm with. You know, like if I'm with a girl... That, that that's what I would expect or perhaps hope for maybe that's a better way to put it because expectations are the root of disappointment but Alicia says that's fair do you find they actually take accountability at all surely most people are a bit ignorant to where they messed up in every relationship the other person's the bad guy when it ends that's usually how it goes it takes a lot of humility and maturity to look at it and just say like you know this person was not a bad person by any stretch of the imagination just for whatever reason, like the compatibility just wasn't there and it didn't work. It didn't click. And that's okay if it doesn't. But again, a lot of people just can't have the humility like that. And as a result of that, basically the ex is always the villain in the story. Just see how people talk about their exes on the internet and that'll give you an idea how most people feel about it. Next we got BH. This looks like a pretty heavy comment, which means it probably will be interesting. No hymen, no diamond is cope for people who aren't even getting relationships in the first place. So what? Are you suggesting that like guys are creating this impossible standard to meet so that they can justify taking no action and trying to find a partner? Is that what you're getting at? I suppose some men are in that boat. Sure. All of them that are saying that? Probably not. You're not going to find a virgin nowadays. And if you do, she's going to be super young. That's true. Or not in America or the West. But one thing that I find strange about the manosphere is the worship of 18-year-old virgins. Look, pal, you don't see me worshiping 18-year-old virgins. I don't. I'm only 21, and I can't stand the 18-year-old girls I meet at bars or talk to in class. To be honest, young girls kind of fucking make me go, ugh, too. If they're, like, too young. Like, the immaturity? Like, yeah. Because they tend to be airheads. Now, there's too much of a maturity gap as age 18 is a very strong developmental year for most people. Agreed. You probably got till about 25, even, I would say. Now, I hate to sound like the feminist, but honestly, if you are consciously seeking that out, it's predatory behavior. Listen, if two people consent, it's like, and that's what they want, then that's what they want. It is what it is. But what I've noticed is, honestly, people looking for 18-year-old girls, a lot of them are like early 20s. You know, guys my age, like fucking, you know, 33 years old, it ain't us that are fucking going out looking for 18-year-old girls. No. You basically just want a hunk of flesh that you can mold to your own whims. Um, some men may want that, and some men may think that that might safeguard against the whole alpha imprint, but I don't think so because FOMO is still a thing too, where she might feel like she missed out on all her opportunities and she still leaves you. It's a damned if you do, damned if you don't. So playing that game, in my opinion, is pointless. But I think, you know, having a girl that's on a similar experience level to you, um, that makes for the best arrangement, in my opinion. Because then if you're on a similar level, then like both of you can develop together from that point to, to you know, just improve the overall experience, you know? But um, women who have genuine lust and desire for you, Yes, offer so much more uh, than just being a moldable child, right? Yes, you'll get more out of the girl who lusts for you than the one who loves you. A 25-year-old girl with a body count of 15 who gets wet just from your presence and drunk text you every weekend is a better option than your 18-year-old virgin hype match who's marrying you because you're rich. True, though I would say true in the sense that the former is good for a casual fling. That's probably how guys would react to that. Um, but for LTR, neither of them are particularly good prospects. Yeah, because the first one, again, she's on a fast life mating strategy when you're looking for a more slow life mating strategy. And the second one is just looking to use you as a transactional ATM, which is trash. 
Of course, I'm not trying to insinuate that I would marry a promiscuous woman. Good. I picked option two. I'm in college, so a lot of the girls that I'll hook up with will openly talk about their hoe faces. I've never considered dating any of these women. MGTOW copers will often say, oh, men are done with women, so that's why there's no marriages anymore. Well, there definitely are an increasing number of men not just checking out of relationships, but they're checking out of work, too. They're just like, I don't want to invest in this shit anymore. I want to just kind of do my own thing, minimalist style. There definitely is an increase in that, and it is having an impact. People are starting to notice it, but not to the degree that they think. That's true. Now, the top percentile of men usually won't commit to a promiscuous girl, but this is by no means the majority. True. You'd be shocked by how many times these girls, the same ones that will give graphic descriptions of the whole phase, will tell me about guys literally begging to be in relationships with them, or even just take them on a date. No exaggeration. Guys are out there begging girls to let them spend money on her, and they're saying no. Clown world. Those guys also don't know about her past. Bear that in mind. If a girl wants to get married, she could find an average looking guy and get it done in a month. The issue is that they don't want most of us guys. She probably could get it done in a month if she lies and hides her past, which many do, and probably would get away with it if she's cunning enough. But the issue is that they don't want most of us. I think you're right with the internet and all that stuff. It kind of inflates their sense of self-worth and their sense of options. And as a result, a lot of those guys in their immediate vicinity sort of, you know, back burner. I agree. The reason why marriage rates are plummeting is because of women going their own way, not men. A lot of men are economically unattractive, socially unattractive. So women would rather be alone with no pizza than deal with bad pizza. Agreed. So it seems that in a woman's head, her tier list usually is as follows. Marry an attractive man, wig towel and pet coping while simultaneously waiting for a chat to come sweep them off their feet, and marry a beta bucks while simultaneously waiting for S Chad to come sweep them off their feet. Those last two may switch priorities depending on the woman. My 53-year-old English teacher still has guys taking her on her dates regularly from dating apps. Juggernaut law. If you can find a girl with a body count of zero, then cool, go for it. But if you can't, then don't turn down a girl with a body count of four just because she's quote-unquote broken or some shit. <laughs> Granted, this advice is empty. It's not like any one of us would actually turn down a girl with a body count of four because she's not a virgin. Right, the context matters. Because here's the thing, right? Even if you don't turn her down on day one, eventually the fact that you're sociosexually, in terms of sociosexuality, the fact that you're different, that's going to come to a head eventually and then the relationship, the end of it's not going to be too far behind. It's going to come to a head sooner or later. So guys just say that because they think it makes them sigma or whatever. But if a beautiful feminine and chill girl that has been in four relationships before wanted you, you'd get on all fours and start barking. Um, I personally wouldn't bark. <laughs> but I understand what you're saying with the simp culture. Yes. Now, sorry for the long comment. I was releasing some pent-up aggression on the modern manosphere. Great content, Pete. Well, yeah, you have to understand a lot of the manosphere is also very young. So again, they're young, they're relatively impressionable, but again, the, the digesting of the red pill and all that stuff, eventually that sort of, that passes and they get to a point of acceptance. Yeah. But again, not every man makes it to the end of that journey. And thus, that's what you're talking about when you run into these guys who just kind of regurgitate this stuff over and over and over again, thinking if you say it enough times, the world will just magically change. It's not changing. The women are out there. They're living. They're doing what they're going to do. It is what it is. Sargo82 says, A man's 18-year-old virgin is the ideal opposite of a woman's 6'3", chad face, seven-figure guy. They are ideals, but most men have good sense of reality and know they aren't getting the 18-year-old feminine undamaged virgin. This is where men are more realistic than women. We all want a perfect 10, but men know they cannot get one and will happily settle for their looks match. I agree with a lot of what you say, though. Yeah, I mean, what he's saying isn't unreasonable. It's just that, again... I think what a lot of men, there are men who will say, okay, zero body count, zero debt, and zero bullshit. But again, they're more inclined to make concessions than the woman who says, no, six foot, six figures, six inch dick, I will not settle. Because men don't really have all that bombardment on the internet telling them, you go king, you got this, while women do. You go queen, you got this. Right? 
Fem cell to feminine says, or you can still get a female virgin, all right? She'll just be damaged in other ways. True. Life's all about give and take, yeah? <laughs> um, sensation. What's up, brother? I voted other because I used to care about a woman's body count. Preferably no more than five is great, and double digits is off limits. Fair. And in fact, honestly, most women, they don't go above 10. Like there's like 20 per 25% of women, I think last time I checked that like are in that boat. It's a lot, but it's not majority. Most women are nine or fewer. Though sometimes I wonder if women deliberately stop at nine before they get married so that they can say they're in the single digits. Like that's like their rationalization hamster. Like if I just don't end up in the double digits, I'll be accepted. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I have almost entirely retired the idea of having a traditional family, which is the only way I would go about forming one. And I'm only 24 years old. Women in the West are irredeemable and aren't even worth the effort of chasing. I don't think you should ever chase because chasing implies they're running. And if they're running, there's a reason. And if women weren't bad enough for you, the entire system is stacked against the idea of traditional family formation. True. True. The old saying, can't turn a 304 into a housewife, or can't turn a player into a husband, is constantly ringing in my ear, and since I've completely abandoned any hope or wishful thinking, I might as well have some fun and join the clown show. George Carlin said it best, when you're born, you get a ticket to the freak show. When you're born in America, you get a front row seat. You might as well just watch the freak show. Take notes. Malakant says, you're only 24, eh? I was 10 years older than you when I threw in the towel. Just be wary if you do try to have fun. Casual sex will mean contact with potentially unstable women, and that can lead to trouble. Be careful. Agreed. <laughs> Keyed cars, clothes lit on fire, and who knows what else. Yes, be careful. Mr. Sean Con, what's up, my brother? Hope you're doing good. I am with the green man here, Undead Chronic. Wah, 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 you won't find one. Wah, 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 going after a fresh 18-year-old is predatory. Wah, 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 you are no, you are not a real man. Sure, whatever. Finding a woman isn't worth anything. She has to have all the worth to begin the conversation. And the thing is, women have the worth. They just have to preserve it. But when they squander it, that's when the value is lost, and then it's like you lost your bargaining chip, so now you can't sit at the table. Yeah. Other people judging my worth mean nothing. Other people telling other women how to judge me means nothing. And I'm sure the women feel the same way, to be honest. Now, if the woman does not find me attractive enough to pay the full price on her part, then move the fuck on. I should add, originally in my blue pill days, I would overlook up to five bodies. These days, nope. The older I get, the less interest I have with settling for leftovers. Of course, they will try to convince me that I don't have any other choice but to pick up a leftover. Of course, that's not true. Of course, I have choices. My doll is one. Being fully single would have been another. True. Yeah, and I mean, you're, you've always kind of been the guy that's lived life on your own terms. I mean, I hear, you know, I hear the kind of life you live. You, you've told me about it, you know, just going and hunting for treasure, you know, investing in, in things personally. Um, like synth technology. I think you mentioned private islands or some shit. I think you mentioned, you know, like you're just, you're living life by your rules. And the thing is this, right? If you're investing in a relationship and a family, you're always going to have to sacrifice some freedom for that because now it's not just one person. Now it's two people in this life. And that means you must be considerate of one another. So I get it that it doesn't make sense to invest and be considerate of a person who doesn't embody the values that you do. I totally get that, and that makes sense. So I understand why why you picked that choice, because you yourself are probably also low in sociosexuality. The dude says, if it's sex in a relationship and the woman has had at least a handful of long-term relationships, she has something good to say about, I'm okay with it. We don't live in an age of chastity anymore, so I'm not expecting my partner to be a nun. I'm not keen on one-night stands, though. I'm not either, especially if you have, you know, shitloads of them. Because it just tells me, like, again, your attitude towards sex, like, it's not special to you. Like, it doesn't mean anything to you. Well, it means something to me. So obviously, if it means something to me, but it doesn't mean something to you, we're already starting off on the wrong foot. Yes? Okay. Peter Parker, you're on a roll these days, Pete. 
Thanks, Pete. Also looked more content lately. If so, glad to see, brother. Thanks, man. Your polls are my first experience of fully sharing my unfiltered thoughts. Gratitude for the rare opportunity. I'm glad I can give you that opportunity, man, because that's what it's all about. I kind of want to give back now that I've kind of basically for the past three years, I've, I've kind of spilled out all my thoughts and now I kind of want to make it more of a forum of discussion. So that's what I'm going for. <clears throat> but I got to say other. Whoops. <laughs> Here we go. I must say other. I'm unable to take relationships seriously at this point. Personally indifferent, but biologically very important to those who want functional relationships in equilibrium. For obvious reasons you mentioned. Ugga booga zugga booga. Yes. After dissecting human nature down to the smallest relevant fractions I could find for so long, the magic is completely gone for me. Like Dr. Manhattan who could see the strings, right? It just sort of, I don't want to say it takes the life out of life, but it just makes you look at life differently in a more clinical, surgical, mechanical sense. It's just different. It's just different. I agree. It's nothing but monkey business and not even necessarily what's best for my organism. Same old trick since the first bacteria to sexually reproduce instead of asexually multiply itself two billion years ago. Everyone in the chain fell for it. Just so I could sit here and scratch my balls, wondering what to do with this absolute meaningly, meaningless mess of random mutations we call life. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the reason we're here is pure dumb luck. Yeah. So it's like, okay, luck. That's why we're here. There's no meaning in that, right? Debatable, I suppose, but whether or not you think one way or the other is a function of your genetic predispositions in combination with your environment. But I don't mind our species continuation, but my personal existence isn't important outside avoiding suffering and maintaining my health. Fair. Some say it's denying what it means to be human. Perhaps, but the ability to put irrational animalistic instincts aside is the next evolutionary step of any species reaching elevated states. Yeah. Imagine what it would be like if we could remove, essentially remove a lot of these MS-DOS mechanisms from humans. What would that look like? It's a fascinating thought. Sure, I will still take some good sex, if given effortlessly. Sure, not going to look a gift horse in the mouth, are you? But already had enough for a lifetime, and I feel satiated and content. True, you went to the buffet, you sampled what you wanted to. All right, put your feet up, have a beer. I got it. I was lucky and very active during my high school years, followed up by some long-term relationships before I saw it clearly. You learn through experience. I used to ruminate over every little sensation and process during sex at the end of my dating career. On a fully developed brain and with the hottest girl I ever dated, a petite 19-year-old cosplayer. Shaped like an hourglass and obsessed with BDSM. For months I did this trying to further understand why I'm willing to sacrifice so much for these pleasantly shaped primate parts and organs. Genetics, man. Ooga booga, MS DAS. This, on top of a variety of previously experiences and books, helped me get over the irrational urge once and for all. It could be argued that, that the ability to do that, the discipline required, again, that's part of your genetic environmental mix. And the fact that you had that, luck is there, but hey, because you had that luck, the outcomes attached to having said luck, allows you to be in the position you're in right now where you can make your peace with it. And it's a beautiful thing. Now I've tried every little nasty thing I desired to the point of gluttony and boredom and truly remember all the sensational details in my nervous system. By the way, ruminating during sex also turned out to unlock the ability to delay or even choose when to ejaculate. Shame it was unlocked only right before escaping the mental prison altogether. Right? <laughs> I'm only 32, but as I'm aging, the quality of girls I'm able to attract decreases while the effort increases. The age pill waits for no one, my friend. Luckily, my hormones are gradually declining as well, so it only made sense to throw in the towel at top some years ago and not end up like the classical, greedy, ego-driven, retired athlete trying to make a comeback, only to get injured and humiliated. It's also like a good video game where you've done all the main quests, side quests, and DLCs, proudly putting the box on a shelf never to be used again. Word. I still need to regularly empty my seminal vesicles to function optimally, of course, but that's no different than any other bodily function to me, except for the unnecessarily dramatic and sometimes fun climax included. That's biology, brother. Biologically heterosexual, intellectually asexual. 
as Stardust beautifully put it long ago, the unrecognized king of modern mating philosophy. Anthropologically speaking, men and women are obviously not equal and contribute different goods to the modern relationship. Yes, her contribution is mainly her reproductive organs. Some may say, but she brings company to, and we split the rent or mortgage. That's true. A pet or friend could be good company as well to get your oxytocin producing production going. True. True, but quality of the company is just as important as the company itself. But that's debatable on comparatively, you know, what's better quality, what's not, right? That's up to you. Now, in an isolated state, female nature doesn't even contain admirable attributes. And you can get away with a much simpler and cheaper place on your own in most cases. Then you have all the extra effort and costs of things you must participate in for her sake. Traveling, dinners, concerts, gifts, cinema, etc. But honestly, if you're with a girl that you really like and she really likes you, that shit doesn't really feel like something that you're forced to participate in. It's just someone that you're enjoying those things with. At least that would be ideal. But does that always happen for a lot of people? No, unfortunately, there's a lot of beta buck situations out there. But we know she's not going to settle for a guy that makes less than her and won't pay the majority of bills. So even if you split everything 50-50, she will still cost you a lot more than being single. Aaron Clary has a book about bachelor economics I have yet to read, but I expect it to include similar stuff. Okay, she kind of brings her beauty to the table, but that's a given. You must find her someone attractive to initiate the relationship in the first place. Of course. That's mutual. And everyone is allowed to enjoy her beauty, so it's not dedicated contribution to the relationship. She can't directly turn it on and off either. Ergo, the beauty is a given. Okay. The main thing she gives is her reproductive organs, as you've already said. Modern gyms and social media has made it very obvious, even for the non-observant. For girls, it's all about gluteus maximus and labia majora, tightly squeezed in a brightly colored shorts while almost exclusively doing presenting exercises. At this point, even aliens briefly glancing over our solar system as a whole couldn't avoid looking at them reproductive organs. At least that's how I feel, if I forget to nut before hitting the gym. <laughs> but then again, my gym is a is next a university in Norway. It's literally the best our species as a whole has to offer. Because female reproductive organs are so biologically valuable, and most men willing to do about anything for them. How women treat them is very important for their market value. Right. So ultimately, if you're going to commit to one girl, and have a long-term relationship with her, and potentially build a family with her, Right, the condition, as he says, um, is important, yes. But sex is also a very um, psychological act. Your brain plays a big role in it. So again, if you have too much casual sex, it could also not just potentially cause bodily damage. Um, again, if you're biting off more than you can chew, so to say. But it can more importantly cause psychological damage if you keep getting ghosted again and again and again and again. Orbs replied and simply said, my thoughts exactly. Once you see through the illusion, there's no motivation left. Seeing the world as a puppet who can see the strings is definitely very different. Yeah, it's a very different experience. Donna Hannaford. What's up, Donna? She says, my answer is other for a few reasons. One, I was widowed at 34 years old and had tubal litigation at 25 years old, and Hubby had the bloke procedure done a month before me. He was 26. We both didn't want kids. Okay. I met many men, though, the last decade that tell me of their experiences of discovering they were about to become fathers and women they chose. In 90%, it was an oops, I wasn't ready to become a father, but I wasn't using a birth control to protect myself from it, and she got pregnant. But I couldn't bring up that I wasn't ready. Those blokes stay mates only and don't ever become dates. Reason number two, if they're a father to more than one woman's kids. Reason number three, current marital status. If a bloke is still legally married because they haven't bothered to get divorced, even after three to four years, blah, blah, means another woman has legal rights to your penis. So I don't even want to see it, mate. <laughs> Reason number four, STD tests and vasectomies are taxpayer funded under our universal health care system. If you want to root, then show me your STD test results and I will show you mine. If you want to root and are still activated, then you ain't going to know about my little day procedure and a week off work when I was 25. So you're covering up as it will likely be downy or get a tism at my age now. <laughs> We're just as judgmental as the blokes about body count, but for different reasons because personal responsibility is a real thing. Sure. So yes, obviously, you know, <laughs> 
Sex is one of those things that, again, men have a lot of hormones associated with it, so we don't always think logically about it, right? It's just all ooga booga, primal shit. But for women, again, their libidos are not as high as ours, so as you can see, they can put a little more thought into it and consider more variables. Um, men don't always consider these variables, though. Maybe a little post-nut clarity is a prereq <laughs> for that. But no, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, you know, the, the relationships and the one-night stands, that doesn't really bother you as much as, you know, this type of stuff. Yeah, like basically a guy who might have a high body count, but he's completely clean and, you know, there's no other immediate problems with him, you might be okay with that. But a guy with a low body count who has an STD in tow, yeah, you might look at that guy differently. I get it. Michael Trent says, I believe we should let the dating market dictate itself. Okay, invisible hand and all that. Let people who are attractive date those they find attractive. The less regulated, the better, just like an actual free market. Our personal opinions on what's available in the dating market does shape it to a degree, but the nature in all humans will prevail. At the end of the day, people will fall for who they fall for. I suppose that is true at the end of the day. But whether or not this variable we are discussing has an impact on that and has can cause it to change, um, you know, that's kind of the core of what we're driving at here. This is it says, too long, didn't read. Fit Fingers says, hey, I hate reading too, but if old PD Paragraphs wants to write a book of a post, then damn it, we must show gratitude. This is it says, I jest, he gets it, not a man worshiper. Fit Fingers says, I can always respect a fellow joker. As can I. Rebirth. What's up, man? Hope you're doing good. There was no vote, but in a woman, she must have less than five lifetime partners for me to take her seriously. Okay, so it doesn't really matter if it's relationship or um, one night stand. As long as it's five or less, you're cool with it. Um, so that would probably be other. Okay. But there's a massive difference between a virgin, a girl who's had less than three to seven sexual partners, and a street girl, which is more than this number. If you've been with a lot of women, you will note very significant differences between these three categories and how the woman carries herself and treats you in the relationship. Yeah. That's true. I would imagine, yes, if, uh, again, because we always talk about genetic environmental mixes, that's a combination of your genes and the experiences that influence the expression of those genes. So, of course, it makes sense that women that have been through different experiences, of course, the way they tackle the next relationship, a.k.a. you, is going to play a major role in how you're going to get treated. So, of course, if their sexual histories are all different, the way you're going to get treated is going to be different. I agree with that. I agree with that. That's a good point. The Y2A problem says option two. I mean, I'm in that category myself and would prefer a girlfriend and wife in that category as well. Correct. Assortative mating, right? People... Contrary to what, you know, opposites attract says, people like people who are similar to themselves because it breeds familiarity and comfort and to some degree security, more so on the woman's end than the man's end. But the point is, um, birds of a feather flock together. So it makes sense that people seek out other people that have similar values and beliefs and, of course, sociosexual attitudes. Yes. VKT says, with this rant, I was reminded of Coltane's video response to Turd Flinging Monkey of Monkeys and Men. First of all, I'm a guy who rejected girls who could not give me a straight and clear answer when I asked them about their health and potential STDs. Yikes, yeah. You should be able to get a straight answer on that. That's a bigger deal breaker for me than the girl's morals. Yeah, because if you're going to lie about that, what else are you lying about, right? Or if you're going to deflect and evade on that, what else are you hiding? especially because I was always a guy who wasn't interested in marriage. Second, in regards to having a relationship, it depends how far you want to take it. I talked about balancing authority with responsibility in another poll you made, and you talked about it in past videos as well. Most women want a man who is all that, who will take care of them, who will be their rock. But are those girls asking for this willing to submit to that man? Are you, the girl, willing to have limited social media if you have that type of guy? Or do you still want to market yourself? Basically, if you find the man that's all that, do you genuinely trust, respect, admire, and desire him? Where just as he makes sacrifices for you, you'll make sacrifices for him. Are you willing to do that? 
are you ride or die? Or is this just some bullshit where you're using me? You know, and that's fair. It's a fair question to ask. And about the instinctual standpoint for this question, if a woman cares versus if a man cares about one's body count, most women want a man who is socially approved by others. So even if they say they don't want a player to virtue signal, most do want a man like that. I think most women want a man that is definitely approved of by other women, because if the man is approved of, then she knows that she will garner social approval by associating with that man. Now, in a hookup culture, a man who has a lot of lays, that's probably the quickest and easiest way to confirm that women approve of him because they feel safe and comfortable enough around him to sleep with him and put themselves in their most vulnerable position, of course. But that's not the only way, right? It's just the main way. So there's other ways. We used to have these vetting processes where communities did this for you, but, you know, not anymore. And men, because of the paternity assurance instinct, if the girl you're seeing tells you she's been all over the world and she is not from a rich family, that's a big turnoff because the man has in the back of his mind the fact that she may be an alpha widow and may try to cuck him eventually. And to sum it up with the fresh and fit analogy, a key that opens many locks is a great key, while a lock that opens too many keys is a shitty lock. Take care and cheers. True. True. When you're the gatekeeper of something, you get to decide what keys open the gate. This is true. So if you're very um, liberal with the keys, um, that's not good. If you're more conservative with it, for the purposes of this poll, LTRs, that's more desirable from the perspective of a man, for sure. Fitfinger says, Coltane's video to TFM truly nailed it. A message men really need to hear, especially at the end. Most of Coltane's video brought something new. He just didn't, he, he didn't just do videos to repeat what others said. Yeah, I think, honestly, it's good to cover all the curriculum, but it's also good to kind of bring your original ideas and takes to the conversation and really just sort of expand on it. Um, because the more we discuss this, the more information we're going to unearth, the more perspectives we're going to um, discover so that, you know, we can all grow together. I agree. Nicholas Trainer said, I have to go with option two. Nobody who's familiar with the data can argue that body count doesn't matter. It's a strong predictor of infidelity. And as the count goes up, ability to pair bond goes down. The ability to have a functional relationship definitely does go down because, again, if all you've ever known is chaos and casual tosses in the hay, how do you have the skills required to manage a relationship? You probably don't. Now, obviously, I'd prefer a virgin, but that would be like finding a unicorn. I was actually a virgin for a long time myself due to my idealism, but after cons constantly being disappointed, I eventually figured, fuck it, literally. Body count now is low double digits, and I've come to terms with the fact that I'll never find a serious partner. Yeah, I mean, you have to come, not, not that you'll never, but come to terms with the serious possibility that it won't happen. Yeah, that the possibility, the probability is fairly high that that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Now, Leslie says, I hope that this isn't too intrusive a question, but what makes you think that you'll never find a serious partner? Pretty much thinking the same thing I'm thinking, like that it's a guarantee because where I come from, there's no absolutes. But generalities, sure, there's a high probability. I'll give you that, Nick. But Nick says, this will probably come off as pretentious, but I don't think I'll ever find a girl who meets my criteria. Ah, okay. That makes more sense. Smart, attractive, and without a lot of bodies? Very unlikely. I could, of course, set the bar lower, but I've worked my ass off to get here. I did that largely because I knew what I wanted, and I also knew that I could never ask for it without offering the same return. Indeed. I'd rather have nothing than settle. I've settled before, and it wasn't worth it. Nope. Leslie says, that doesn't sound pretentious. Rather, it sounds decisive and resolute, both admirable qualities. To quote an analogy that is often used in the manosphere, you would rather have no pizza than bad pizza. I get it. <laughs> exactly. That sums it up nicely. Yes, some men do develop the power of self-respect and dignity and integrity, and they value themselves so that when basically someone comes up with some smelly-ass anchovy pizza, the guy's like, yo, that's some shit pizza. Don't piss on my leg and tell me it's raining. That's three-day-old pizza right there from the sofa cushions. I ain't taking that shit. Get out of here. <laughs> yep, and, and men like that are starting to increase in number because they're becoming privy to what's what. 
This knock. What's up, brother? My base answer is I'm a virgin guy seeking a virgin girl, but it comes from my own set of underlying values, which makes room for rare exceptions. I'm filing myself under other. Okay. At the core of my beliefs is that sex forms a soul tie between two people, a bond, whether they like it or not. True. It's a very beautiful thing on its own and very intimate. Yes. But if the person's part ways after forming this bond, it rips a piece of their souls with it. Yeah, I think whenever you have very strong emotional experiences that damage you, a piece of you is always lost in that. And then you kind of have to recover. Yeah. That's where the damage occurs, not from the sleeping itself. So you must do your best to only share it with someone you're with for life. Would be ideal. Yeah. But for many people, that just didn't happen. Now, for me, it's about finding a girl who lives by this value. And realistically, that's going to be a virgin. However, if a virgin girl got together with a guy at 17 and five years later, he dies a natural death, accident, illness, innocently killed, I'll treat her morally as a virgin. I'd extend the same courtesy to a grape victim, given that she wasn't reckless with her own safety. Though I would never pretend to weigh all the trauma that came from these things, threatening our potential relationship in other ways. Yes. I might even forgive a girl who had slept around if she had gone above and beyond to redeem herself. The reason I'm lenient is we live in a groomer society. When media, school, church, and parents promote hookup culture to kids, it's hard to fault a girl or a guy for making the initial misstep. Would I have done better? I have sympathy for all the girls that would have made better choices if only they had the information that was kept from them. My sympathy dries up pretty fast when they decide to run with it, however. A girl redeeming herself from hookup culture would look something like disowning her family and guiding the next generation of girls away from it. I'm not talking about crying on TikTok about where all the good men have gone at the ripe age of 35. <laughs> Regarding practice what you preach, I certainly do. My own preaching is somewhat spiritual and happens to apply equally to men and women. That said, I fully appreciate the evidence-based argumentation for why the girl's body count is of far more relevance to predicting the outcome of a relationship than the guy's. True, because again, we've always said this, right? As a man, your count has less significance, generally speaking. I and mean, this has been reflected in the fact that women are willing to share men. Women are willing to overlook men who have had passed because of pre-selection, possibly. And generally, men could separate emotion from sex. All of us? No. Like, for guys like me, it's very serious. It's very emotional. But don't look at me and consider me the norm in this regard. Men, on average, tend to be higher in sociosexuality than women, right? There's like this average in the middle and men tend to be on the upper edge of the normal and women have to be lower in the normal range. And then at the tails, you kind of have a lot of people low in sociosexuality and you have a lot of people high in sociosexuality. And that's what you got going on. So yeah, I agree with that. But my own rules are just a cherry on top because it's a protection for my own soul. I've seen what promiscuity does to men and women and it's not pretty. I'm also doing it because options are already slim, and I know firsthand that the more marriageable the girl, the stronger she will want a virgin partner herself. Yes. The average girl wants a Casanova, but it's not the average girl I'm looking for. Correct. You're looking for a tail of the distribution, which again is an uphill battle, but yes. Leslie says, wow, very eloquent. Your words are far more compelling and convincing of the meaningfulness of purity than anything that I heard in church as a teenager. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it was a good read. John McCansky says, taking it from women's book, I only want good pizza, otherwise no pizza for me. Fitfinger says, I too reject pineapple on pizza. This is it says, you like extra sausage. Fitfinger says, with secret sauce, as every man should. Ah <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, you guys are funny. Citramate says, option two is the closest. The reality is that most of us would be willing to compromise for the right girl. Dying childless and never married is a real possibility for me. And while it's not the worst case scenario, it's not exactly one I'd look back on and say, what a good life I lived. Fair. It's in no way ideal. I agree with you. I really don't mind at all with relationships because a girl's got to put out if they want to keep their men. This is true. This is true. I can look past a little bit of casual since people need to test the waters, but I really don't like the idea of it just being a normal casual activity. Right, exactly. Like, just fucking around, like, 
with such an intimate act, so like like it's a fucking Tuesday. Yeah, that's I think what really grinds the gears of a lot of people, men in particular, because of their mate guarding instinct. But you know, there's some understanding that in the process of dating, you're getting towards the serious relationship, and there's some back and forth. Maybe you get to the point where you make it official. Maybe you don't. Maybe it's six months to like a year. You know, these things happen where you were kind of seeing somebody exclusively, but it wasn't quite a relationship. Like, I get that, all right? Like, I get it. But, um, you know, again, that verse is just flat out, clearly friends with benefits and fucking flings and fucking one-night stands and shit like that. It's like, ugh, no, get that shit out of here. No. Mm -mm. No good. But if I got a chance, I'd probably do it a little bit, but I honestly don't think I'd enjoy it that much anyway. Depends on the girl. It would mostly just be a way to end the 6.5 years of celibacy I'm currently on and feel like less of a loser. Well, feeling like a loser implies you care what other people think about your current 6.5 years of celibacy. Who gives a shit? The emotional connection that came with sex is what I really looked for in the relationship. Yeah, of course. Because the experiences are way better if you actually like the person. But I can see myself still getting into a relationship with a girl like that if the personality seemed extremely good but it would basically have to feel like i'm getting a girl who is absolutely enamored with me physically to want to stay in that relationship yeah the reality is that i don't really like spending too much time around people who live in the moment so this hypothetical is unlikely to ever happen there is at no perfect woman it's just what you're willing to compromise on and what you're willing to compromise on only if they were amazing in every other way yeah you're never going to get all the boxes checked off. I just think that men have a much better and more realistic understanding of the fact that you're not going to get all the boxes checked off. You know? Because social media and, and mainstream in general has done such a bang-up job at telling women that they can have it all when it's just not true. Granjero says, I voted other, but given the choice, I would have voted not caring for flings but caring somewhat for relationships below is my reasoning. Firstly, there is often a quoted statistic about the relationship between body count and the likelihood of marriage to end in divorce. As a data scientist, I have a problem with the interpretation of this statistic. Body count is not randomly assigned. It is a choice, and therefore the correlation between body count and subsequent divorce is subject to selection bias. In fact, the selection bias is obvious. Women of low self-esteem and low self-control choose to have more hookups. Therefore, the sample is biased towards damaged women. Therefore, more of their marriages end in divorce. In reality, the notion of impaired pair bonding probably does have some relevance, but it's certainly not as large a statistic would suggest. Of course. So obviously, the thing is this, though. Women who have lots of casual sex in particular, right? We would agree that there's a difference between a woman who has, let's say, 10 partners, where they were all, most, for the most part, serious relationships or serious attempts at serious relationships, exclusive, let's say. And then a woman with 10 one-night stands where she was fucking like kind of like half drunk if not fully plastered for the experience, right? And then they don't get called the next day. It just leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Everything attached to that lifestyle, let's say. That's what kind of leads the damaged impact on it. Like the casual fling, it sort of complements that type of damage. And that's really what causes this. So it can be argued that indirectly body count is there. But again, what men are looking for and I suppose to some degree what women are looking for, is they're looking for indicators that sort of hint at this damage that lets them know like, hey, I need to steer clear of this so that I don't waste my time or this person's time. But because of this, I don't tend to think that a body count of around 10 in the modern world is necessarily evidence of poor mate quality. Depends on her age or his age. In fact, it would be quite difficult for a girl to resist the social pressure of never having an experimental phase. So in a way, I think an around 10 body count is fairly normal. Well, considering only in that same stat, like what, 20% of women have a 10 count or greater? Um, one in five is not insignificant, right? So it's more common than we think, of course. Um, but nine or fewer seems to be more the norm still, currently. But that said, I do not think that mate choice is very important. And if you choose wrong, it could be devastating to your life. In ancestral times, it definitely was. But in modern times, no. A lot of oofy-doofy innovations. The problem is the quality of a woman is very hard to uncover. 
At the onset of a relationship, we're blinded by our hormones, and the prospective partner instinctively love bombs you to solicit commitment. It requires an incredible amount of self-introspection and a deep understanding of the opposite sex to truly see the quality of a potential mate. Moreover, this deep understanding of women is impossible without data and experience. Therefore, I don't believe that men can be successful in mate selection without having played the field themselves at some point. Yes, not without luck, at least. <laughs> I personally think that I have decent insight for psychology, and I also have plenty of data. But even still, I ended up being deceived by my now partner in some ways that blindsided me. For context, my wife was low body count, seemingly traditional, and very nurturing and supportive. Over time, I realized that there were deep underlying issues, but at this point, I'm too committed. We're working through the problems as best we can, but it's a constant struggle. Ultimately, you need data, introspection, and a lot of luck. There it is. Body count is not a good benchmark for most women, not to mention that could just lie. True, at the end of the day, um, women could just lie about it, and therefore you don't have accurate information. However, what we're trying to really get at here is why people care about it. The reason why men care about it is clear. The reason why men care about it is biological factors, mate guarding instinct. While the reason women care about it, um, there could be a biological component, but there's also more of a sociological component there. Like, for example, like if a culture, like purity culture, for example, um, in some religions it's more intense than others, like they might pressure you to care about that kind of stuff, and then that shapes your expression and so on and so forth. But the point is we're driving at like why people care about it. Now, the next one is by Nat. She says, option two. I think if your partner had flings, it directly translates to them not having self-control, which is not good for a relationship. That's true. I know most of us on this chat would prefer a virgin. Not necessarily. Um, as you can see by the poll options, most people, like, they're just like, look, just fucking don't rip me off. Don't play me. Fair. However, in this day and age, yada yada, so I'd rather he have a meaningful sexual experience than one night stands. Correct. Because then you know at least what you're getting is at one, a comparative price, and two, what you're getting is actually something that's meaningful to both you and to him. Yes, I agree. And this is where pair bonding comes in. I want to make sure we can connect. Hopefully we find each other, though. Yeah. The thing is, though, that a lot of the guys that have limited sexual experience comparatively, a lot of those guys are invisible to women. Not as invisible as the pure virgin guys where, like, you know, they're in sub-5 territory, right? But again, even like normies en masse are becoming invisible. So those guys might exist in your life. You just, you don't see them. Now, Eric Gare says, I personally believe that the first serious relationship, say past the age of 14 or so, that one has is the most important. Once you get past that one and the next one and the next one, you diminish your ability and or willingness to actually try making a relationship work. Correct, because you're constantly say, looking at like all the hiccups and speed bumps. And you're like, oh no, not this again, fuck. And then you're more likely just to not tolerate it, which isn't really that girl or guy's fault. It, you know, it was the last person. So it's like, you know, you got to keep that baggage out, but easier said than done. I know. People pull out all the stops for their first serious partner, but by partner five, it's sort of, why would I cry over this person where there's a mountain of dick in my inbox? A lot of girls do feel that way. Yes. I pet ghost says, yep, the glue loses its stick adhesive, if you will. Correct. Diminishing returns. Dopamine, right? The more you partake in something, the less fulfilling it is with each successive dopamine hit. It's weaker. I agree. Flemutter, what's up, man? For the first question, he says, I'm going to answer this void of my spiritual views. Relationships are about transactions, not love. Exchanging different things, sexuality and resource to each partner's satisfaction. It's like a trade by barter. The Psych Hacks channel just made a video on this. That being said, why would I compare sexual history to hers? What she really wants me for me is resource, not sexual purity. I believe this is partly why they are pulling the degrees in high income bullshit. They have destroyed their sexual value and they know it. So like toddlers, they are trying to compare apples to apples, but sadly it doesn't work that way. Correct. Men don't care about your money and status to the same degree you care about his. Correct. By the way, I selected I'm completely indifferent and I don't care. I truly believe the institution of marriage is irredeemably destroyed and a generation must be wiped out for repairs to start. I am only looking for something casual at this point. I'm adapted to the solitary life since 2014. I don't think I can live with a woman or anyone for that matter. Whenever I try, I use the kingpins approach. Coffee dates, grab a drink, basically anything that can quickly lead to sex. 
This way I, edge, I hedge my bets. If I am successful, I'm getting at the kingpin's price. If I fail, well, I didn't fall for some sucker shit or pay full price for used goods. Liver King out. <laughs> Fair. Practical approach. Part one. Real names not given. I hold conflicting values on sexual experience. If a guy has sexual experience, he's pre-selected by his previous partners. If a woman has sexual experience, then it's like a car's depreciation. Higher the miles, the lower the value. So generally speaking, yes, that is what we have observed. There are women who will overlook that and share a man if he is of high value. This is true. While men generally do not do this with women, which is where we get the saying, men must create value, women must preserve value. Yes. However, just understand that even as a guy, there are options you will close yourself off to by having a high body count. That's all we're saying. And for the women who wish to comment on that, they can do so. Part two. In the end, you chose other. Realistically, all women will have had sex or a relationship at some point. Looking for a winner with zero XP would be like speed running Dark Souls with your feet. It's possible, but not very probable. If you're going to enter a relationship, she will have you, she will have more experience than you. It's a personal decision after that. Part three, I have a very interesting situation. I have no experience. Am I entitled to a mate with similar experience to me? Nobody's entitled to anything, but you have a better bargaining position to make that point. So that if someone comes around and says, do you practice what you preach? You could say, actually, yeah. I'm this guy's other account says, honestly, if we enforced the zero body count rule, the species would come to the brink of extinction. The no flings rule is the only compromise. My personal, me personally, my account is zero, and I'd like to hold my partners to the same standards, but not in this day and age. At this point, I'll settle for a woman that isn't a 304. Christopher Park says, based reality dweller, my man. Yeah, honestly, I think this is a fair take. Right. Someone who, basically, someone who's not a hoe that's going to embarrass you, like, that's fair. Same thing for a woman, you know, a woman dating a guy who turns out to be a fucking womanizer, and then, like, everybody sees her quote-unquote boyfriend hooking up with another girl at a party or some shit. Yeah, these experiences, they're fucking embarrassing. And if you could avoid those experiences, that would be ideal. Yeah. Silverback Wamahue says, I practice what I preach as a guy. I was lucky enough to be handed the genetic golden pot, if you will, but I still maintain a sense of basic decency and self-respect. I don't just fuck around because I really don't want to find out. <laughs> Fair enough. Racking up body counts just doesn't suit me. It's not fulfilling to say the least. This does not mean that if I like a girl and she likes me back, I will not sleep with her. I will not lie to myself. Sure, hormones are hormones, I get it. When she comes to me of her own volition, is kind and physically fit, I will smash. I mean, that's your dopamine reward center saying like, yo, win. <laughs> I am not willing to pay more uh, for something that someone else got for free. After my first girlfriend, I realized that self-respect and the capacity and ability to walk away from a woman who is showing hoe tendencies and behavior is very important. I know you're not a virgin, and yet you want me to care. Provide or free up more resources for your enjoyment and usage. Nah. Fair. So ladies that are listening, yeah, like th this is what a lot of men really think. They don't tell you it directly, but this is what they really think. So again, you're like, oh my god, why did this guy ghost? This is why. Trevor West, other. So long as it's genuine, healthy, and is honest, I generally don't care and never have. As such, it won't be too many partners as exploration will be brief before chasing what they truly want. I hold men myself to the same standard. Fair. Stanislav Hulis says, it's like someone who changes friends often. How can this person be someone who will share deep connection with another person and who will be willing to share their secrets with such a person? Fair. I think there are many reasons why it is bad for women to do it. Another thing is type of women who are promiscuous tend to be party girls that are often bad with money, alcohol addiction, and are like free prostitutes. True, chances are if you're bad with your mate choice, you're probably bad with other things in life too. Yep. Another problem, female microbiome in their pride parts is moist, warm, and inside their bodies. That makes best place for viruses, fungi, and bacteria. That means it is more riskier for them compared to male. Listen, man. Man or woman, just take care of your parts, yeah? Probably few problems can bring female mimicry suggests that females mimic their partners more often than males. Okay. Women trade their body for commitment from men. That is the age-old evolutionary contract at its core, sure. 
If she's willing to be promiscuous without commitment, other men would not want to commit to her because they do not need to do it. Correct. If the other guy paid $500, why should I pay 1000 Exactly. Because if many people enjoy free stuff, no one is willing to be stuck with the bill when others could enjoy it for free. Exactly. People who want monogamous lifestyle will often have low body count because they will try to choose best option for a long time. It's what they have in mind. Often people who want to be poly would have high body count with self-control of an animal. Monogamous people are more spiritual and can make deeper connection. Fair. Again, sociosexuality. It's important. Malikin says, I'm not looking for anyone, but it would be a factor for me. However, I believe also that the razor cuts both ways. A woman should be wary of a man who is a former PUA as old habits die hard. Yes, they do. Sargo82 says, hey, Pete, the Punani pumping pirate. I bet you're laying more pipe than a plumber on cocaine. I am not. Just got done listening to your last stream when this poll came out. In regards to the poll, I will pick up option two, as I think option one is delusional for a guy to expect in these modern times. I'm just being realistic. If I had my way, it would be number one. To me, body count in a woman matters as it is a sign of a fast life mating strategy, which I'm not about and never have been about. It would also make me wonder if a woman could be happy with just one partner if she is used to going out every week and having bedroom fun with a new guy. If a woman says, say, had five partners that were all a few year long relationships, that'd be fine with me as it shows she won't bail at the first hurdle or argument and will not be tempted as much to cheat on me. I hope. Body count for a man is a very valid question and one that was hard for me to come up with an answer for. I really don't have a great answer for this. I think as long as the guy's body count isn't too high, he shouldn't lose any points. Anything under 20 is fine in my books, and I think it's very different for chads, normies, and sub-fives, as I believe a chad with a high body count is more likely to cheat. A normie or sub-five doesn't really have the opportunity to cheat these days, and will more likely hold any relationship he has as sacred. I have more to say on this, but it's been a long day at work, and I'm knackered, so I'll leave it there. This is true. A very good nuance to add to the discussion. What you look like is an indicator of what you can and cannot get away with. So again, the closer to Chad you are, the more like a promiscuous woman you may be able to act and get away with. Very true. The Greenish Knight says, day and age be damned. If anything, fewer to no prior partners indicates discipline and impulse control in this day and age. Unfortunately, I have no interest in a partner who's been jumping from partner to partner and participated in modernity's interpersonal economy of sexual favors. Quid pro quo. So I would say this again, I think we said it before, right? In the modern age or even in the old age, right? There are most people on the fence based on what the social norms and stigmas are, aka the environment that will affect the genetic expression that ultimately prevails. Casual means casual, serious means serious. And then at the tails, you have people that'll be casual no matter what and people who will be serious no matter what. So the person who has impulse control in this day and age is at this tail of distribution. And that means they're very hard to find. But most importantly, love is investment. It'd be a terrible compromise for me to dedicate myself to a woman who only offers what she's already given someone else, especially if it's at a cheaper price. Or a woman who doesn't grant me her most sexually active years on TGIS planet, on this planet, uh, before children, at which point any man becomes the least important person in the family. Being her priority for years before the introduction of children is important. Also a good way to vet a woman's potential for bonding and childcare. Very fair. How, she's a treat, how she treats you is very, very important. I agree. New Game Plus says, option two. But that being said, I have worked with some people who play pretty fast and loose with their definition of a relationship and change partners about as often as the seasons. So additional scrutiny is still required. I'd also caveat one fling for either sex as a write-off. A young and dumb allowance, if you will. Girls get lied to a lot, and at least when I was growing up, virgin was a pretty harsh insult the older you got, and many guys jumped at first opportunity to not have that leveled against them anymore. True. As for me, I practice what I preach. I've only slept with one woman. I've had LTRs with, um, plus my one young and dumb allowance at a drunken house party. Remember those? I find the saying, you are what you repeatedly do, holds fairly true in the context of today. I acknowledge that people can change, but... Like you, I see things in a balance of probabilities. If you've been with 100 people before me, I don't think you're likely to stop at 101. No one seems to have a problem applying this logic when it comes to repeat violent felons or drug addicts, but for some people, want to feign ignorance when it comes to sexual history. Past behavior is an indicator of future behavior. 
more often than not. So strangely, some girls even think it's a good thing. I had a girl I worked with, I think, hit on me by telling me about some of the wild stuff she's done, like licking taints or how good she was at giving head, thinking it would be a turn on. It was not. Correct. It was not. Especially if you're low in sociosexuality, you're like, what the fuck are you doing? Yep. Laser focus. I chose option two, but have little inclination towards option four. At this stage, if the person gives off modest vibe and if I'm blinded by love, I may tolerate with her past flings. Sure, hormones blinding. When you're in it, it's different, as they say. Now, as you said, men in general will have issues if his partner has a history of giving her body cheaply to others. I am not an exception to this, but at least I still hold the standard to myself. To be honest though, if the gods have endowed me with attractive looks, I may have fallen to the temptation. Up until this point, the girls who are ready to offer her body to me usually give off a repellent vibe. So it's not that hard to hold the said golden rule. True. Uglier you are, the easier it is to abide by the rule. It is what it is. Not gonna lie, if I can't find any woman who can satisfy criteria number two, I may change my mind to number four in a few more years. In five at most. Um, In this day and age where everything is sexual, it's starting to get unrealistic to find someone without a casual past. And like... And like already been said in this space, good catches got caught early. Yep. As one accumulates more years, it's unwise to not adjust our expectations. True. With all the long discussions from you and the subscribers, I'm loving the direction in which this channel is going. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Chris Palmer. What's up, man? Number one for my emotional investment. I did not hold this view at all when I was young, and I do not say it's a realistic expectation. It's not. It is, however, every bit as realistic as my giving up all my freedom and investing in being her forever security as she ages and brings less and less casual value. True. In other words, unrealistic as it may be, it's equally ridiculous for a man to give away everything he inevitably does without getting the appropriate reciprocal experience, which is the eyes only for me type of investment from her that only comes from having known only me in that way. Yes. That, again, that's the ideal. But most men, I would say, in modern times, we understand, like, hey, are you at least on the same wavelength with me in terms of how you look at sex? Is sex just some sort of casual joke to you? Then we can't really have a conversation. Yeah. I've had three virgins in my life at three very different ages, my age and hers. And I could say with total certainty that the relationship experience was night and day. They don't even have the ability to feel that way about you when they have been with other men. While I wouldn't go that far, what I would say is that if you're not the best she's ever had, eventually the hormones will wear off, the mask will fall off, and it's going to become apparent, and she'll probably leave you in search of someone who does measure up. Yes. For them, it's as simple as taking the maximum emotional interest and investment they could ever have had for a man and simply dividing that by whichever number of men they've been with. The resulting number, one divided by number of partners, is the amount of impact and amount of value you will get from all of the cost and investments a long-term LTR costs you as a man, including opportunity cost. What I'm talking about is completely pragmatic and doesn't even consider the prehistoric possession, biological certainty, purity, religion. We give up a ton. They benefit a ton. And the least we should expect is to get something of value close to commensurate with the cost, which simply has not happened for me with non-virgins. As evidence of it not being about hang-ups or purity, I submit that I don't care in the least what her count is when she has no expectation of investment. That being said, you've said you've been with a few virgins, so you took some V-cards. So again, I'm wondering if you took those V-cards, was your intention to try to stay with them long-term? And it was, just, it was something else that caused the relationship to end. I'm just curious. Um, because if it, your intent was not to stay with them long term, you just took those V cards. I'm just saying it, it contributes to what we're talking about here. Jericho271 says, I voted number two, but leaning towards four. I don't really think virginity is a good indicator of the long-term reliability of a relationship. Interdependence is. True, because again, FOMO is also a thing. Never experienced the whole phase. Oh, I want to experience it now. If you make yourself at least partially dependent upon somebody else, you will make that relation last longer, even if it bites sometimes. 
If that interdependence breaks, then you can only count on infatuation to make your relationship last, and that is volatile to say the least. Infatuation is a shitty foundation. Agreed. We tend to conflate virginity with fidelity, because back in the day having sex meant children and therefore being married or getting a shotgun marriage. The consequences were quite dire if you weren't married. I would agree with your description and maybe add that relative virginity got retired as a relevant relationship yardstick the very same day the pill came onto the market. Yes. As far as previous relationships go, I think both partners should be of equal experience so as not to throw the relationship out of balance from the beginning. Yes. Spot on. Agreed. I think seeing it in the same way as staying in, keeping a job would be a better idea in today's environment. If you had 24 jobs before, but today you have no other options than the one you have now and no savings, you will stick with that job. On the other hand, if you have fuck you money or access to good unemployment benefits, then you can treat even your first job as a throwaway. The number of previous jobs may reflect badly on you, but your financial independence is better, albeit hidden, predictor of your future employment behavior. Same goes for relationships. True. True. And I guess I can see why you're leaning towards four, because at the end of the day, if what you have now ultimately is really, really good, then again, that's probably going to be an indicator of what's to come. I see what you're saying. Femcell to feminine. Dear Pete, on this question, I don't know what to think. Disclaimer, long-winded, estrogen-fueled rambling that may or may not make sense. Forgive me. I've commented on your channel before, so you might already remember me. I am an almost 30 years wall female virgin, still trying to lose it because of colliding concerns and timelines. Concerns including losing more desirability over time, fading health and looks, getting too old, aging out of the sexual marketplace to the point that having high purity doesn't even matter when you're a post wall and no one really wants you. I have also been rejected for having high purity and men ghost a lot. Well, don't fuck with fast life mating strategists. Some men find it weird or unbelievable for a woman to be 25 and up and still a virgin. They perceive high purity as a red flag instead of a green one. In some case, this could be relative to my age. Men have questions. If something is wrong with me or what's really going on, I was raised in an extremely religious household, lots of emotional trauma, but I deconverted. So I cannot use I'm religious as an excuse for my virginity as much anymore. Again, I can't help but wonder. I mean, if you're physically attractive, you're an attractive woman, um, you know, you're, you're a virgin, right? You're, you're, you have feminine energy. You're friendly. You're, you're fun to be around. You have values and stuff like this. The question is, the guys who are attracted to that, men who are also low in sociosexuality, are you attracted to them? Do you even notice that they exist? Or do you just, or like they just kind of go under the radar because they don't meet the looks criteria or something like this? I'm just curious in that regard. Because it sounds like you're trying to turn a bunch of players into husbands. You're trying to get a fast life mating strategist to play this game. And it's like they're never going to play that game. They're just looking for a smash. And then they realize that your experience is zero. So it's like, well, that's going to be a low quality smash. Or perhaps they have a conscience and they're like, no, I don't want to take your V card. Could be that too. More than one way to look at this. But I do not care if my male partner, in nearly any context, has high bodies. I think it actually feeds into pre-selection knowing I have a highly desirable man that can pull that much if that ever happens. As long as he is clean with no STDs, STIs, is no one's baby daddy, and has some typical traditional provider protective characteristics for a few IQ points, he can have a body count over A+, plus or 10+, plus. I don't really care. Or so I like to tell myself. Perhaps convincing myself I don't really care as a cope. Could be, if it really does bother you, that is. The lovey-dovey romantic vanilla fantasy of both partners being virgins at the same time with deep-seated feelings and strong commitment is cute, and I'm not dismissing it. But that seems like a far-fetched fantasy at my age and stage of life, and based on the casual hookup culture and porn culture most Western and Westernized nations are in, I don't think finding a virgin male that passes even my mid-tier normie basics looks test is really going to happen. Yes, despite my fem cell like questionable aging desirability dropping by the day, like most voids, I still have standards. I know this makes things more difficult for me to some extent. Anyways, 
Most people are about getting what they can, when they can, however they can. Most men are like that, yes. Women tend to just choose what they want, provided they're good-looking enough. I am tired of having fallen behind in dating experience as this awkward late bloomer with fem cell tendencies. The virginity card? I'm trying to get rid of this thing. Well, again, I wouldn't try so hastily to throw it away because it is valuable. But again, whether or not men will care if it's valuable, again, it does depend if you're attractive. Because remember, attra beauty comes before modesty. If they don't find you physically attractive, then it doesn't really matter. That's true. But modesty is right there at number two. So again, like I said, that does that does make one wonder. So the dude replies and says, if you're just trying to get rid of the virginity, it should be as easy as asking any man that is single and is somewhat attractive to you to have sex with you. We're a bunch of horn dogs. If you walked up to me a few months ago before I started dating again and asked me that, I'd probably say yes if you were of average looks or above. However, I'm getting the vibe that a lot of the religious trauma you underwent is still there. So I may be keeping you from doing that. Either that or your other unfortunate female pool that is too ugly for men to even want to have a one night stand. Yes. That was the first question I asked was the second point. Like, what, what, where are you on the look scale? It's the first thing that came to my mind. Because, again, beauty comes before modesty. Yep. So if it's not that, then, yeah, perhaps there is some sort of unresolved trauma that's uh, preventing you from uh, really opening up and, and letting a guy in. But that being said, you don't want a fast life strategy, Chad. Um, you're probably looking for a more of a slow life strategist. Yeah. Leslie says, thank you for sharing. You offer a perspective that is often overlooked in the manosphere. Just a suggestion. Have you ever considered professional matchmaking service? If you want that matchmaking service to work, you better be realistic with what you tell the person. Yeah, because a lot of matchmakers out there are like, what the fuck? Y'all on crack. Ayatollah Nofap, and he says, hey, Pete, I would say that I practice what I preach. Religion, morality, and masculine versus feminine barely register with me compared to worrying about diseases. I ended up going with option five, other, because there are different types of mileage. Tommy Laren and that angry video she put on a few years ago is a good example. On paper, Tommy Laren is like the ultimate tradcon dream come true. Unfortunately, arrogance is her emotional baggage. So I wouldn't want to talk to Kim Kardashian or Tommy Laren in real life. Neither would I. <laughs> <laughs> Bogdan Pugh says, chose option two, but also would like to add a pinch of option three. As an old millennial... Welcome to the old millennial club. I remember a time where there was a balance between fling and relationship. Before dating apps were a thing, people kind of had a reasonable amount of previous partners before they paired off indefinitely with someone. It's okay to have two to three high school flings and a couple of mid to long-term relationships in your early 20s, just so you can get your bearings on relationships and intimacy. I think five or six is a reasonable number for men and women alike. Could be higher, but no more than a dozen. The purpose of these previous experiences would be to learn, make yourself a better partner in future relationships, while simultaneously make better decisions on what constitutes an ideal partner, so that eventually you will settle down with someone near your 30s. However, today we live in a society where the majority of terminally online people have the attention span of a goldfish, <laughs> coupled with room temperature IQ. This is especially true for women, no matter how many partners they have. They don't seem to learn shit. There is absolutely no reflection, accountability, or reasoning happening anymore. We are reduced to hairless monkeys on instinctual autopilot. Ooga bugga. The older I get, the more I think humans are far from these enlightened beings that they think they are. A lot of pseudo-intellectuals out there. Yes. Everything we do is somehow related to sex. <laughs> yep. Even the space race to the moon was essentially a giant dick measuring contest between the U.S. and U.S.S.R., George Carlin said it best. War is just a bunch of guys getting on a battlefield and waving their pricks at one another. Yep. To be clear, I'm not saying that only women are at fault here. That's true. The endless sea of simps are also the issue. Yes, enablers. No screening whatsoever on the individual level for things that could be respectable in a woman. She's hot? Yes. Would smash? Nothing else matters. This leads to no incentive for women to cultivate anything resembling a reasonable personality and attitude, and the downward spiral perpetuates further, and gives them no incentive to develop relationship skills, managing them, maintaining them, 
cultivating them, nurturing them. Because they can get whatever they want if they just flash some pussy. Yep. Regarding the virgin question, I think it's okay to remain a virgin up to a point in your life. If a woman remains a virgin to her early 20s, that's a commendable effort on her part. But if she stays that way up until her 30s, it starts to become weird. When I was 25, I wouldn't have had any issue dating a 20-year-old virgin. Now that I'm in my 30s, I don't think I would have had the patience to deal with a virgin. All sorts of questions would come up in the back of my mind. Is she a religious fanatic? Is she asexual? Does she have a medical condition? Is she actually attracted to me? Is she even capable of physical attraction? If I'm dating a 26 to 27 year old woman, I would expect her to have some sexual experience so that it would not be required on my part to teach her how to sex from zero. Wouldn't want her to be the town bicycle either. As I stated earlier, half a dozen in terms of previous relationships is okay in my eyes. To conclude my long-winded comment, body count, flames plus previous relationships, is okay as long as it's reasonable. Not a bad take. Anyway, feel free to leave a like, feel free to leave a dislike on this comment, call me an asshole, but whatever you do, don't report the comment. It's useful information and it will help someone, even if it doesn't help you. If you are amused by Pete reading my comment this far, hit the sub and bell icon, or unsub, fine by me. As long as you get the information from somewhere, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yosh. That was good, sir. That was very good. Well played. <laughs> Love Cactus says, The reality of the dating market in 2023 is that most people have a body count. Yep. If you want a relationship and want the unicorn virgin, you're going to be waiting a while. Plan B. To get a virgin today, you would have to break the law. <laughs> Oof. Fit fingers. Number two. I could perhaps let a few things go if a couple Punani Petes and Dick and Duskies were involved. I mean, how could you blame them, really? Ain't no fertility crisis with these two man whores around. I will say about 10 to 15 years ago, I would have been far more lenient than I am now. But to be fair, I rarely thought about LTRs. It was mostly about that fast life shit where body count didn't much occur to me. Chasing around all them big titty goth chicks with tattoos will do something to a young lad. Who am I kidding? It still does. Fuck me. <laughs> Can't teach an old dog new tricks, huh? Braveheart Production says, Because I'm still a virgin, her body count cannot go past one. Anything past that is a no-no for me. But if I did meet the right girl, then I think that option two would be more realistic. Correct. Correct. You know, and that's fair. Again, as I said, the lower your count is, the more that you can... The more of a bargaining position you have. That's always been true. Yeah. Moisture Patrol says, I would have chose number one if I hadn't betrayed my ethics a number of years ago in a fuck it moment and a five month fling with a chick. I swear I almost made wizard status, damn it. Arcane knowledge will forever be beyond my grasp. I chose number two or else I'd be a hypocrite. Point being, if I were playing the relationship game, I'd prefer someone with very similar ethics personal boundaries, and impulse control that I practiced growing up and generally still do. A kid raised Catholic messing around with a carousel rider a healthy pairing does not make. That's fair. He acknowledges the importance of sociosexual compatibility. Yes. The next comment is from Thinking Ape. This is the one I pointed out, so for those who are curious. Um, but after the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, something happened, and I pointed out that the agricultural revolution followed by the Industrial Revolution... Uh, which is incorrect, and I already pointed that out. He said the agricultural revolution preceded both the Bronze and Iron Age, just for your information, so the chronology is off there. The agricultural revolution began in earnest around 10,000 BC, the Bronze Age 2,000 to 700, and the Iron from 1,200 to 550. As you can see, there is some overlap, because there was regional variability in this regard, but agricultural revolution preceded by both by thousands of years. This is my autism, but what you wrote was factually wrong. Sorry. And I said, thanks for pointing it out. Of course, he did me a solid. And Peter Parker said, pardon my autism thinking, broski, but your cognitive empathy is too high to qualify as an autist. All three of us will score high on most online tests for autism, since they mainly focus on interest of details and objects, but leaves out most of the social intelligence stuff that requires more hands-on testing. True. Leslie says, for the older folks here at Peach Channel, do you agree with me that maybe there should be a statute of limitations on, of let's say 15 to 20 years with regards to a person's past? For example, if I'm dating a guy in his 50s, 
I don't really care one iota about what he did or didn't do in his 20s. If I really like the guy, I could put a positive spin on it either way. If he spent his 20s as a man whore, then I would just say, it's good he got it out of his system. <laughs> if he spent his 20s completely celibate, then I would say, I can relate to being a soul life strategist. Now, if he'd been a man whore in the last decade, that'd be a definite deal breaker for me. Okay. Marcus A says, at later ages, it matters less, I find. If your guy was a total slayer or the opposite of you, you won't really care because the competition has changed to comfort. Who wants a headache when we could just cook something and chill the fuck out? It has been a terribly long day. I mean, I'm 35 and I'm feeling this shit. <laughs> yep, not too far behind you, Marcus. Primrone says, okay with relationships. I got to take a hard line on the flings. Yeah, because again, that, that mate guarding, it's always going to fucking make you go, God damn it, I'm paying $1,000 when that fucker paid 500 It's always going to bother you. Yeah. So I don't expect women to be virgins past their mid-20s or even before. Neither do I. If they are, then I don't know about why. Could signal a problem. Could. Or they could just be very religious, possibly. As a fem cell to feminine said. But just like incels who are KHHV, which is what? Um, it's kissless, hugless, um, something virgin. I can't remember what it is. Into their um, 30s. Uh, it's not unreasonable to suspect that a problem is a symptom of a larger issue. After all, it's my belief that normies walk into these things so long as they achieve the basic developmental milestones. True. If you're doing what's been expected of you by the social group to some degree, someone's probably going to notice sooner or later. Yeah. Neurotypicality and whatnot. But the fact remains, I don't trust women who've sampled too many men. Yeah. Their job is the sexual selector and the de facto reproductive bottleneck is to be selective. Yes, when I'm in a relationship with a girl, how is she really going to judge me? Will personality win through? Will I be enough? Probably not. If she has a huge body count, chances are of you not measuring up to someone, mm, pretty high. Or will she see a sub-5, broken, acne-scarred, 5 foot 5 manlet, and pray tell, how will that compare to Steve's better face, John's taller height, Bill's more outgoing personality, Adam's greater wealth, Ryan's bigger dick, Jim's greater relationship experience, etc., etc., etc. Exactly. The imprints. Normies will say somewhat correctly that this is an extension of analysis paralysis, that men experience like this too. While that is true, it's a weak argument. It's important to remember a few things of men and women, which is the sexual selector, women, which has an immensely higher sensitivity to disgust, Women, which has higher neuroticism, thus more sensitive to negative emotion. Women, which for nearly all time carry the greater consequences for a sexual encounter. Women, we're not the same, no more egalitarian obfuscation of the truth. Namely, socially engineered bullshit that is permitted to persist because of the comforts and safety that we have in a first world society. Men and women are identical in all senses when that is not true. Agreed. So I do agree that, um, yes, I don't expect a woman to have to be a virgin by her mid-20s. That's unrealistic. Um, and generally, if someone is a virgin for a prolonged period of time, there's either a good reason or something's kind of sus. I do. I kind of get that. Um, and it's not as simple as just black and white. That being said, though, um, the experience between a sub-5 and a normie is going to be different. And thus, that's why if a sub-5 tells a story about his experience... The normie is going to kind of give a different spin on it that, again, is not really empathetic or understanding. So, yeah. All right, we got a couple left, and then I think we're going to refresh and wrap up. So Joe Raven says, I absolutely practice what I preach. I have always taken physical relationships very seriously. Salute. And beside that, something a woman says when you bring up the body count issue, almost without fail, is why is it okay for men but not for women? To which I tell them, I don't think it's okay for men or women. I hold myself to a higher standard than our depraved society, and I will only have a woman who has the strength and character to do the same. AK, she's on your wavelength. Yes. People who constantly give in to their impulses are little more than monkeys or hamsters in that regard, whether it be sex, food, drugs, gambling, etc. Why would you want someone like that for a partner? Exactly. It's disaster waiting to happen. Also, because I have always held myself to the very same standard, I hold women. It also makes it very easy when the woman becomes indignant about the body count issue to just walk away. It completely disarms them. 
Again, it puts you in a better bargaining position. Exactly. When you have the strength and will that sex or the prospect of sex holds no power over you, you can set any standard you want. Mm -hmm. And most women hate that because they can't use their main weapon against you. But the ones who meet the standard, they'll love it because they're like, wow, this makes it so much easier. Yep. Last comment is Marcus A. Pretty long comment. Okay, let's do it. Number two, I'm largely in the undead chronic no hymen, no diamonds camp, though that is kind of unrealistic if you want to live in the West. I primarily interact with women for sex, though not always. I really think men and women can be friends. I've known a lot of really cool girls and the vast majority are nowhere near pure. I've also learned nearly as much from women as from men. As far as emotional investment goes, the difference between a virgin and a 304 is mind shattering. For real, it's no joke. Different environments that shape their genetic expression. Correct. Also different genetic potential probably from the onset. So I know I need to get a higher body count and I prefer she have as few as possible. Plus, my emotional investment will be proportional to her body's. I don't even want a body count, to be honest. I just want to be able to get laid whenever I want, preferably with my hypothetical forever girl, but this has become my working plan B. Girls love it when they know you are desirable. Just playing the game that the girls set the rules to. They are the selectors, after all. This is true. I wonder if women were set to a higher standard and changed the game. Would they be able to make more logical decisions and really change society? Girls should get together and create a pussy union. <laughs> There's no incentive to. So they won't. Not in the West, anyway. I do feel a visceral disgust when I think about other guys smashing the girl I'm with. Mate guarding response. I've learned to just be present and enjoy who I'm with, though. Much healthier and more enjoyable. I agree. It doesn't really pay to dwell on it. But at the end of the day, ladies who are listening, you have to understand that at any given time, this is probably going through his head. You just got to accept it. It's possible she has never had good sex. It's possible she was really drunk every time. It's possible that you are indeed the only good partner she's ever had. It's possible the other guy really did mean nothing. Unlikely, however. If she can openly discuss all previous partners, good and bad, plus 10 points. The more bodies she has, the more she needs to lie to you to make you feel insecure. The more bodies men have, the clearer we can make decisions about women we are considering investing in. True. That was kind of standard, so let's drop some devil's advocate here for fun and profit. It's not like we can or should try to create rules here. It truly is up to the individual. Yes, I may have chosen number two, but if the right girl who had everything I wanted and was very into me, even after all my tests walked into my life, would I say no? Even if she had a body count of six rather than the dreaded arbitrary five? I'm atypical like most of the individuals here, so I could just as easily be judged as she could. I'm doing my best, and so too could she. Chicks can rack up a body count of 10 in one year or less very, very easily, even good girls. They stick with one guy for a while and realize they are dating someone like their father or something. Then break up, don't know how to deal with it, so they rebound one to one more. Then get frustrated and say yes to a couple hookups. Boom, she hits five and is disgusted with herself. Then she learns and does better. Who else thinks they could do better with the hands they were dealt? Then add infinite sexual power at age 18? You think that in any of our darkest days, we wouldn't have welcomed easy sex to make the pain go away for a moment? What if we as males were given a reverse body count score for not banging chicks? I'd have the equivalent of 200 fucking bodies for all the time it took me to calibrate myself out of a hellish childhood and home life. Should I then be disqualified? A lot of girls genuinely really do want a good relationship with an equal. Seriously, talk to girls and find out. No, don't talk to the bartender. Learn from your average Jane. Because we usually say most girls, right? Most girls aren't bartender hussies coping with trauma with alcohol and numbed by casual sex funded by tax-free tips. True. Most girls are just girls chilling in the single digits. Yeah. The problem is, though, that the girls that we are talking about, though, they are increasing in number over time. And that's a function of the culture. Basically not disincentivizing it. Now, you could apply much of what we say about the permanence of a body count to a negative Matthew loop. A high body count makes infidelity far more likely, just as failure makes failure more likely. Yes. We all have a story, and I think everyone here would find it repulsive to tell a dude who has been alone and is figuring his shit out to go suffer forever or take the rope. 
So where is the empathy for women who, yes, have it easier, who are naturally less inclined to problem solve, who suffer just as much from broken homes and who are more susceptible to social media, which is one of the worst evils in the modern age? Girls really have it bad out here too, just a different set of problems. Yes. And we would tell the lonely dude to get his shit together, figure out what he wants, right? Well, should it be a surprise that when you tell women they have soiled themselves permanently, they don't want to hear it? Should those girls take the rope or what? No. It's almost more cruel to tell them they are worthless, unattractive, and the rest of their life will be a nightmare. Yes, I agree with this sentiment. However, I would say probably, especially in more recent videos, what I say is that there are outcomes attached to these events that have transpired in your life, and you're just going to have to accept them as a man must accept the outcomes attached to his life. It is what it is. That doesn't mean you're a bad human being. It just means that you're probably not a good mate choice in the eyes of that man. And it is what it is. But as the woman, who's the selector, you get to decide, do I really give a fuck that this guy doesn't think I'm a good mate choice? Or if you really like him, you probably do give a fuck. And you have to understand that that's the cost. Anyway, how many men enjoy this seething revenge, not understanding that they are really just looking in the mirror... Yeah, true. A lot of men get stuck in that rage and depression and they just lash out because again, they just, they don't know what to do with that. They don't know how to accept it and just let that shit go. Yeah. So don't get me wrong. There's a lot of truth in our discussions, Pete. A lot of someone's past is a good indicator, but if you can change yours for the better, apply it to everyone with a pinch of salt. The Virgin Stacy is the equivalent of the Turbo Chad. Shit isn't real and you only lose by chasing it. I agree. So make your mistakes as you must, as we all must, and acknowledge the outcomes that are attached to that. Whether you like it or not, there's going to be pricks out there that hold the mistakes over your head for the rest of your life. You got to deal with it. As someone who does talk to a lot of women in a legitimate, non-judgmental friend capacity, you might be surprised how many of them aren't dreaming of her banging Chad. The girls who go for relationships get fucked over just as much as 304s. It just hurts them a lot more. True. True. And getting fucked over, sadly, is what can convert a lot of women to real force. Just as it can convert a lot of quote unquote decent men to bad boys. Now, at the end of the day, the one girl I loved added color to my life every day we were together and it was far better for it. Curious why it ended then. Would would that I could have that again and even strive to return the favor instead of entertaining this animosity isn't perfect, the enemy of good. So again, yes, you try to see the good in things. You try to enjoy things for what they are. And I understand all of this. Yes, everything that you said, I understand it inherently. But it doesn't change the fact, again, that at the core of our MS-DOS, men and women alike, we are what we are. And I would say, though, that again, with men's 000 standards and women's 666 standards that we always joke about, whatever you want to call it, they're just that, they're standards. And you know, some men, they might treat it like a hardline boundary and they will not compromise on anything and it's unrealistic, I agree. And there are women, same thing, they will not compromise on that boundary, it's unrealistic and I agree. And what happens to those people? You and I already know, they end up alone. That's what happens. And they either have to be okay with that or not okay with that. That's their problem, not yours, not mine, right? Great. Beyond that, you also have people who are a little more realistic about things. And because they're more realistic about things, they're able to extract enjoyment out of interactions with the opposite sex, despite knowing all of these things that we discuss. And of course, that's definitely a healthier place to be in. But unfortunately, that might be something that's out of reach for a lot of these guys right now who are kind of in this pessimistic uh, low point in the digesting of these pills, so to speak, where they're, they're kind of nihilistic, fatalistic, or just pessimistic, just broken and depressed, if not outright angry. These people are not fit for relationships yet because they haven't accepted it for what it is. And women also, they have their own journey on their side too, getting, you know, chewed up and spit out by fucking hookup culture, right? Getting screwed over by the guy who said, you know, I'm not really looking for a relationship right now after screwing around for six months. I get it. I get it. Okay? It happens on both sides. And it sucks when it does. But at the same time, 
we have to have empathy and understand both. I agree. But I'm not too worried about women being able to find empathy among their peers. I'm not worried about that at all. I have it. Men inherently, for the most part, have empathy for women because we have a protective provider instinct. In the other direction, though, not so much on average, which is why these spaces exist. And we have these interesting conversations that we do. And that's pretty much what I have to say about your comment, Marcus. Okay, so we're going to reset one last time. Let us see if we have any additional comments. So I'm going to sort nada. All right, we're good. So that was the body count discussion. As you can see, most people kind of had not as hard line a take as women looking at the manosphere from the outside might have thought. Most men kind of look at it like, listen, sex, it's kind of a special thing in the context of an LTR. And if I'm going to basically have sex with a woman in an LTR, and I'm paying the price of a relationship, I don't want to do that with a girl who's given it out like candy in the past. I just don't. And guys who generally have high body counts themselves, they tend to understand kind of their weak, their bargaining position is kind of weaker. Yes, they can do the pre-selection argument and things like this, but it won't really sit right with the women in question. So, yeah. While men who have lower sociosexuality themselves tend to have a much stronger bargaining position on this, if it really is such a big deal to them. Um, but at the end of the day, life's about compromise. And um, again, as you can see, men do have an open mind here that, hey, if it's like a girl who checks off a bunch of other boxes and like no other red flags are really getting thrown up here, um, they're going in understanding what they're going into, aka the risk of an alpha imprint and stuff like this. But they can go in with a relatively clear conscience. So I think men are actually pretty realistic. And I think the women that commented too were fairly realistic as well, which kind of lends credence to what Marcus was saying at the end there. So this was a very good topic, um, very thorough, but I think that's about all we're going to get on the subject. So feel free to leave a like, feel free to leave a dislike, call me an asshole, whatever you do, don't report the video. It's good information and it will help someone even if it does not help you. If you enjoy the content, hit the sub. If not, unsub. It's all good. As long as you get the info somewhere, fine with me. Bell icon, you might get notifications, you might not. I have no control over that. But if you want to tr see if it helps, go ahead, hit the bell. But uh, the purpose of this channel remains the same, right? We're trying to spark that discussion. We're trying to spread the information and the awareness. We're trying to stop men from self-deleting. Listen, you run into these types of situations, not the end of the world. It's part of the human experience. It's part of life. And ladies, if you're watching, hopefully you're getting some useful insight from the male perspective. And hopefully you took advantage of the opportunity to share your experience on this poll. And um, hopefully the men listening to them learned a thing or two from that end as well. As always, I'm that guy, Pete. You refuse to invite to gatherings. I will catch you for the next one. But for now, I'm going to head on out. Y'all take care. Bye.